Uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Could, could I just ask everybody to take their seats again? We're about to start the next session. Um, and the sooner we get to our seats, then we can start. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for returning so promptly. Um, I hope you'll join me now in welcoming the UN Youth Delegate, David Giles, who's going to address the forum. Over to you, David. Chair, ladies and gentlemen, um, my name is David Giles, and I'm currently one of Ireland's two youth delegates to the United Nations. I also finished my undergrad degree in law and business here in UCC only last month, having spent many, many hours in this exact room. So I'm glad to see that UCC is hosting the first day of the forum. Each year, the National Youth Council of Ireland and the Department of Foreign Affairs select two young people to represent the voice of Irish youth in foreign policy. This year, my co-delegate Jessica Gill and I have had the great opportunity to travel to New York, to the General Assembly and the Commission on the Status of Women, to Rome, to the World Food Forum, and across Ireland, meeting with young people, hearing their stories, and then seeking to elevate those stories in policy-making spaces. Next month, we'll be back in New York for the High Level Political Forum to present Ireland's Voluntary National Review, which is our progress report on the SDGs, which we contributed to in the form of a youth chapter, which is significant because it's the first time any country has had a youth chapter in its SDG progress report. I consider open debate to be a fundamental pillar of good democracy, and I'm very glad to be here today to speak and offer some youth perspectives on the issues to be discussed over the next days of the forum. A key theme of the forum is Ireland as a global actor, and I've taken great pride in seeing how Ireland presents itself at the United Nations as a voice for human rights, disarmament, peace, and security. Much of this respect we command undoubtedly comes from the story that we tell, a story of migration, poverty, famine, and self-determination, self to relate to others and to encourage them to trust in us. This year, 25 years on for the Good Friday Agreement, we can also tell a story as a country who knows what it is to live without peace, but also one which sees the value in diplomacy in our own context before looking abroad. Ireland on the Security Council has been a strong and principled advocate for the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, for humanitarian access to Syria and Turkey, as we heard from earlier, and the peace process in Colombia. However, it is very clear that the Council too is flawed by design. The abuse of the veto system prevents countries from presents the Council from fully implementing its mandate and allows aggressors to evade accountability. The permanent membership of the Council reflects the global powers of a different era, and there is an undoubted need for greater African and small island developing states representation on the Council. As Kofi Annan has said, a nation has the right to defend itself. When it comes to the broader issue of peace and security, legitimacy rests only with the Security Council. To maintain this legitimacy as we move forward is in this increasingly antagonistic world. I believe reform of the Council's membership, its structure and its vision to be absolutely necessary. That said, I've also seen firsthand how elected members of the Security Council, including small countries like Ireland in the bigger scheme of the world, can have a real impact at the UN, particularly when I had the opportunity to advise on the Youth Peace and Security Agenda, which Ireland dedicated its last meeting of our Council term to. To give an example, Jessica and I, when we were at the UN, met with young Sudanese women, activists who were part of grassroots movements, risking their lives and their futures in the strive for democracy. Jessica and I met with these women and then had the opportunity to introduce them to our Irish diplomats and advisors at the UN, who then went on to invite a Sudanese young woman to brief the entire Security Council at our last Security Council session. For the people of Sudan, this very small connection led to their lived experience being shared on an international stage. And for me, it was WhatsApp messages and pictures um, of people huddled around a live stream that kind of instills a conviction in me that small countries like Ireland, even in the face of systems that are far from perfect, must continue to uplift the voices of those too often unheard as we fight for their most basic rights and freedoms. Both at the United Nations and closer to home, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has marked the largest security and humanitarian risk since the Second World War. The experience of the Ukrainian people have captured our hearts and minds, and Ukrainian refugees now represent a growing and welcome part of all of our communities. It has also brought Ireland to question its security and defence policies and our perception and practice of neutrality through engagement with European security and defence. 
We have seen changes in the foreign policies of our neighbours, including Sweden and Finland in joining NATO, and other EU member states in growing their military capabilities. Without a doubt, the invasion will go down as a turning point in history, as will our response and the lessons that we learn. The basis for Irish military neutrality, and what we even mean by neutrality at all, will be discussed, as it has been at previous points in our history, over the coming days of this conference, a debate which I hope captures the nuance and the complexity of the issue. I consider military neutrality to be a core tenet of my national identity. However, neutrality need not be synonymous with being passive in our own protection. As we have learned this morning, and will continue to over the coming days, the responsibility of the state to protect people must account for the need to adapt, to address our vulnerabilities and the new facets of security risk. In preparing for these remarks over the past few weeks, it's somewhat challenging to assess the tone of young people with regards to international security policy, largely because I think before the invasion of Ukraine, our generation in Ireland had the luxury of international security being of little concern to most. But my generation has largely known has been stability. And by those of us following international news, war has been something that took place in trenches in mainland Europe in junior set history books. However, our understanding of security and defence in these modern times must also change, for the nature of the threats that we are trying to protect ourselves against are far more advanced and subversive than that of times gone by. This afternoon, we'll have a panel on cybersecurity. And although this is largely considered to be a novel threat, for most young people nowadays, their first interaction with the word security at all is linked to cyber on that personal level. But in recent years, particularly with the HSC attack last year, and more locally, the attack on our neighboring university, MTU, of ransomware, we have seen the ability of cyber attacks to really undermine the systems that run our society. The threat landscape has changed because times have fundamentally changed. We live in a digital era, and for many of the young people of today, it is all they know. I, for one, have never used a checkbook. My family no longer has a landline. I've never used a physical map to get from A to B. And in my four years at UCC, every assignment submitted has been via an online portal, none of which I entirely know works, but all of which has become normality to me. And during the pandemic, all of our lives, in many extra facets, rely to a greater extent upon the internet. Although internet-based technology has enhanced our lives greatly, our reliance and the dependence of much of our industry upon the internet, in my view, heightens the need for further protection. A, pan a panel later today, we'll discuss hybrid threats, the most recent, or one of the most recent, being the attack on the Nord Stream gas pipeline. While undoubtedly a threat to security, this incident has also highlighted the broader issue regarding energy security, which going forward needs to feature more prominently on the security agenda. Up until recently, a quarter of Europe's energy came from natural gas, with 45% of this natural gas coming from Russia. Both in addressing our climate change obligations and in the interest of our national security, Investment in renewable energy, with an aim to make Ireland as self-sufficient as possible, should be a key policy objective. More broadly, in the climate change space, climate change must be also be recognised as a security threat that it has now become, as it acts as both a conflict multiplier and conflict in of itself in the face of diminishing resources around the world. I also look forward to the panel on information and disinformation, which is all the more relevant in this increasingly globalised and interconnected world. On social media, I've seen the great learnings and creativity that can come from bringing people of different perspectives together, but also the hate that can fester and create divisiveness outside of our homes in a very physical way in our communities. The UN Secretary General's Our Common Agenda calls for a path forward centered around renewal of the social contract through reinvigorating our institutions with a focus on trust and deliverables. Both the appearance and the practice of inclusive, transparent communication from both the government and partners, I think to be one of the single greatest tools to tackle disinformation. This year will mark 100 years of, since Ireland joined the then League of Nations and began as an active member of the international community. As the teacher mentioned earlier, um, this also marks, as we know, 50 years since we joined the European community. Over the past 50 and 100 years, Ireland has really carved out a place for itself in the world. And it's all the more important at these anniversaries that look, we look forward and see where this path will bring us, to allow us to be proactive rather than reactive in our international security policy. I welcome this forum as an opportunity to hear from a variety of stakeholders in what I hope marks the beginning of a more public, inclusive and engaging approach to foreign policy in this country. 
Gurv Mila Gurv. Thank you, David. I'm sure I speak for all of us when I say how proud we are to have you as our youth delegate at, at the UN. That was a wonderfully considered, thoughtful and, and well-delivered speech, so thank you. Um, with that, I would now like to invite Richard Brown, who is the director of the National Cyber Security Centre, along with his panel for the first of, of two sessions on emerging threats, this one on cyber security. Over to you, Richard. So, um, my name is Richard Brown, might have come up already. Um, we're going to talk today about the developing and slightly more complicated, in some ways, issue of cybersecurity. Now, to, I'll introduce the panelists in a moment, but before we even begin, I'll just frame what the issue is and is not really briefly for everybody, because this isn't simple and it isn't straightforward. Um, and even if you think Cyber is a, is a complex technical issue. Obviously, it has societal, political, geopolitical, military, and security implications for everybody. Um, cyber is, in many ways, a confounding policy issue because it's in everything, and everything is in cyber. We've, in the last 30 years, wrapped the world in a web of communications technology. Some of it's physical, fiber. Some of it's virtual in terms of radio waves. Some of it's in space. Some of it's below the sea. But that network powers our economy, our society, and our personal lives. Um, that makes cyber confounding because it is in literally everything that we do. Um, it's in our personal lives. It powers our electricity grids. It powers our energy supplies, but also our health services, as we all know too well. So for some of us, it was a long couple of weeks, two years ago, it's honest. Um, the, but in turn, that changes the geography of our, of our national security as a state. So when we look at security traditionally, we've looked at it in terms of our physical Cartesian relationship on a map. But now, we can be touched by anywhere on the earth, and we can touch anywhere on the earth, thanks to IP connected systems. A range of threat actors, states, individuals, hacktivists, criminal groups, have evolved over the last 20 or 30 years. I mean, the, la the first significant cyber attack here was in 1998. So this is not, in reality, a new threat. It's a threat, that, a threat that has evolved and ramified and changed and grown quite significantly over the last time, period of time. Um, and these actors now pose a wide range of threats to the services we use. And they aren't just kinetic. They aren't just, it can be turned off. They pose a threat to our democracy in some ways. They pose a threat to freedom of speech. They allow actors, be they state or otherwise, to insert themselves in political discussion and their other activities at a granular local political level. Um, the organization I have responsibility for, the NCSE, leads the national effort to defend against these threats. We detect, deter, respond to, remove incidents before or as they occur. We try and build resilience across, resilience across government. We try and build skills. We try and build capability. This is not obviously a simple task, and it's not one we can do alone. Cyber is a team sport, and it's a team sport in three different ways. First of all, nationally, we work very closely, first of all, with our colleagues in, in the Defence Forces and the Gardaí on the national security side, but also right across government, in regulators, in media, in wherever you go in government, local government, national government, agencies, they're all our partners. Secondly, at a larger societal level, we work very closely with industry, people like Bob and Richard, to understand what's happening globally, what's happening locally, and what the best way of dealing with this is. Remember in air or space or maritime, the domain is publicly owned. It's accessible to all, it's a public commons. But in cyber, the domain is owned by private companies for the very most part. It is in wires owned by companies. It is in IT systems owned by companies or governments. It's out there. So the state cannot simply insert itself into that process. It has to do so carefully, legally, and in a very appropriate fashion. And lastly, and this is where like, this discussion is particularly useful, we also have a profound international role in the NCSC. Cyber has implications in diplomacy. Foreign affairs handle cyber diplomacy. <coughs> but we handle a broad swath of cyber resilience activities across the European Union, 
OECD, uh, OSCE, Council of Europe, and other international fora. Cyber is a global phenomenon, and it is managed, dealt with, insofar as it can be, on a global level, and we'll touch upon some of those issues. So we've as assembled a panel today with representation from academia, from industry, from the military, to explain and explore many of these issues with you. Um, we have, I'll allow the panel to introduce themselves briefly in a moment. We'll go for about 40 minutes, maybe slightly more, going through a couple of questions we've thought through already, and then we'll take some questions from the floor, if that's all right. So, Bob, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, Bob McArdle, or Robert McArdle, to keep my parents happy. Um, and I it's work. Bob. Yeah, it's Bob. Um, I work in the private sector in the company Trend Micro, which is a security company. And within that, I lead a team that is dedicated to forward-looking threat research. So essentially, we look at the next one to three years of where we think the internet is evolving, where technology is evolving, social trends are evolving, and then where cybercrime will look like in two to three years' time, so that we can kind of try to get ahead of it as much as we can. And we also track a lot of the major adversaries and so on today. And then outside of that, I do lecturing in uh, University College Dublin and in MTU in malware research as well. Katrina. Great. Uh, Katrina Heinel. Um, lovely to meet you all uh, today. It's hard not to be nervous, quite frankly, um, sitting in front of the nation's top thinkers uh, in this space. Um, I guess the perspective I'm hoping to bring to bear, um, based on my experience, is um, I've been involved um, within many of the multilateral state dialogues, um, and these have been occurring at multiple levels, so bilateral, regional, within the post-World War II security architectures like the OSCE that we heard about today, the ASEAN Regional Forum uh, in another region, um, and up to the UN level. So I've been one of the experts who has conducted training of um, diplomats uh, uh, on cyber diplomacy um, matters, uh, as well as um, capacity building for officials across various regions. So um, I want to kind of bring out that experience because it's the framing, I think, of where um, I hope to bring some value to the discussion today. So thank you. Thanks, Katrina. Thank Richard. My name is Richard Parker. I'm a VP in cybersecurity for Dell Technologies. I'm based here in Ireland, so don't let the accent throw, throw you off. Um, so my role within Dell is to deploy, I run our cyber defense organization, and we deploy technology to protect the Dell brand. Um, in addition, I'm part of Cyber Ireland, which is a nonprofit organization that really brings industry, uh, education, and the government together to look at these types of issues. So this, I look forward to this discussion. Thank you. General? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Brigadier General Sean White. I am the Director of Communications, Information Systems, and Cyber Defence at the European Union Military Staff in Brussels. It is a co constituent part of the European External Action Service. Um, I'm a Communications and Information Services Officer with 38 ex years experience, and I've served on uh, numerous overseas missions, three missions in uh, Lebanon, uh, Somalia, Chad, and Kosovo. Uh, in my current role, <coughs> excuse me, I'm responsible for the EU military staff, communication, information systems, and cyber defense policies, and guidance in support of EU CSDP missions and operations, and this is a particular remit of mine given that we have Irish uh, soldiers, men and women, serving uh, in these missions, as well as civilians in the civilian CSDP missions. With regard to my day-to-day -day role, I conduct regular liaison with uh, EU partners, both um, within the EU bilaterally, uh, and also with uh, NATO, with the European Defence Agency, and also work with uh, PESCO projects, which we heard some uh, um, colleagues speaking about this morning, particularly in the area of cyber defence, and particularly in the area of network interoperability. Thank you. Thanks, John. Wow, it's quite hard to follow all of that, uh, especially as an academic. Uh, I'm Chris Johnson. I run the Engineering and Physical Sciences Faculty at Queen's in Belfast. I also was appointed to the National Cyber Advisory Board in the UK by a Deputy Prime Minister. I help chair Industrial Control System Cybersecurity within NCSC. That's our, our equivalent of the, of the Irish one. And technically, the areas that I work in at the moment are cybersecurity of machine learning applications, and that includes some military systems. Yeah, very straightforward. <laughs> Great. So let's start by turning to Bob. Um, Bob, for, for those of you who have been looking at the same present on this before, um, is an expert on literally what's happening in the cybersecurity world right now, today, and what's happening in the next six to 12 months. So Bob, what's happening in the world today? Cool. So when, when we talk about cybercrime today, you kind of um, there's separate attacks that affect both states and then the kind of citizens within those states, and increasingly the attacks will cross over between both of those uh, because of the interconnectivity of everything. So 
There's generally five big buckets you can think about when you talk about cyber tax. It overgeneralizes a bit, but generally speaking, you have industrial cybercrime as a service. You have espionage attacks, so state versus state. You have disruptive attacks, like wipers and DDoS and things like that, which we'll get into. Um, hybrid warfare, which has been mentioned, which also includes things like disinformation campaigns. And then online terrorism, which is actually less of a concern than some of the others uh, that are on that list. And of course, attackers are never nice enough to stay in one bucket. They tend to cross between uh, multiple ones um, when they're doing that. So if we start off and talk about industrial crime as a service, it's called as a service because essentially everything in crime is available for hire. And if you are setting up a criminal business, you don't have to do much of it yourself. You just subcontract out everything. So if you had somebody running a ransomware campaign that's delivered by email, they would go to one organization, they would say, we want you to send out tens of thousands of spam messages to Ireland and UK or wherever else, and we will pay you this much per thousand, and they will deliver those. They will go to another person, subcontract writing the actual malware or malicious pro program as well. They'll have another subcontractor who will do the negotiations with the unfortunate victims and so on. So it's highly service model driven, and that makes it very, very flexible and very robust. Uh, one of the most mature markets you're gonna see in technology today. Um, and that within that, there's generally two major categories of crime. You have theft-based crime, stealing data, right? And then you have more um, extortion-based crime, so threatening to release data, threatening to take down networks and, and things like that. So on the second category, you would normally think of ransomware, which is generally, it's already very bad, but it's on the rise if you look at most uh, metrics on it. And surprisingly, it's actually not the most impactful cyber crime that we see today. In terms of just pure monetary loss, that's something generally called business email compromise. So if you've ever heard of an unfortunate sea level person somewhere wiring far too much money to the wrong bank account, that type of thing. But that doesn't, it's very hard to write a good media story about that, so ransomware gets all the, the headlines. Um, and all of that will affect the economy of a country, whether it's the theft of the, the information and data leaving the country and obviously the loss of information there, paying ransoms, uh, engaging, you know, instant response, or even just paying to secure things in the first place. That's all money that kind of could have gone into growing whatever the organization was uh, for hiring more staff and so on. The second category then, espionage, um, tends to be very targeted in nature on the specific country or specific individuals that the people want to find out about and that have something that the other side ultimately want to have. Um, so when we think about it in terms of Ireland or any country, you have to think, what do we have that would be in an interest to another state that has the capability to take it by digital means, right? So for us as a target, for example, uh, a large percentage of Europe's data and headquarters and so on are located here. We're English speaking, so anything that targets the US, the UK, Commonwealth type countries will just hit us by default because we speak the same language. Uh, we're a vocal EU country on certain international rules and things along those lines. So again, people would be interested. And that always overlaps with crime, we said you'd see these days. So it's not nice enough that kind of nation states do their things and criminals do their things. There's always overlap these days. The last three categories, disruptive, briefly, we talk about things like ransomware, of course, taking down networks, wipers, which are doing the same thing but not even pretending to, to actually be a, a ransom element to it. And then things like denial of service attacks, which is just massive network floods of traffic at a certain target. And those are quite effective for short periods of attack. And then the last two, the, the hybrid disinformation is honestly one of the areas that most countries are the most vulnerable to uh, when you talk about disinformation, to the fact that there's an entire extra uh, section of, of this four day forum on that on I believe Tuesday, which I'll be tuning into. And essentially there you're looking at finding polarizing issues that can be amplified by, by cyber to pull both sides to one side. It doesn't really matter what the issue is. You just pick a country, you find something they're kind of 50-50 on, and you tear at both sides to kind of rip apart the fabric of the country. Um, and beyond that, all war warfare these days is kind of hybrid. And the last one, I mentioned online terrorism because people always ask about it. It's actually the least concern of all of them. Um, terrorists uh, regularly will use the internet for propaganda and especially for recruitment of people into their organizations. But when it comes to actually causing terror online, it's actually quite limited what you can do. If you take a scenario, imagine we have a water plant somewhere in Cork and a terrorist group detonate a, an explosive device there. The population of the country will naturally be worried, where's the next one going to be? Will it be a school? Where is it? If it's a cyber attack, however, and it goes offline, 
there's a lot of interest in psychological studies in this, but essentially you kind of feel anger and worry and maybe confusion about what happens, but what you don't generally feel is terror. So it doesn't really resonate to the same uh, way that a physical attack would. So those are the kind of five main buckets. Thank you. I mean, we'll jump along. Um, obviously, when you look at the types of things and people and assets that are attacked, um, at a societal level, we have to worry about our critical infrastructure, but companies, Richard, also have to worry about their assets. No, their no, assets are often our assets. No, so, you're, you're exactly right. And, and I think if the, the thing about cyber, it is crosses, it's not just industry problem, it's not just government problems, it's everybody's problem. If you look what happened to the HSE, just insert any company's name. And it's really what, you know, we, we wake up in the morning and just hope we're not in the headlines the same way. And the things that we're kind of focused on to try to limit the impact of these type of threats that Bob just, uh, or Robert, for your mom, <laughs> just mentioned is, you know, with ransomware, it's, it's no more about how do we prevent it. It's accepting that it is going to happen. And it's really looking at how you're going to respond when it happens. Do you know who to call? if there's an event, you know, because time becomes of essential to really get there. Additionally is, how are you protecting all your data? If you have your key assets and you're backing up your data, are you able to recover it pretty quickly? Or is it going to take weeks to recover or days to recover? Again, all that's going to impact the way that you operate. Um, you mentioned uh, people with uh, phishing attacks or sending uh, the CIOs, sending out money. That's another area we're looking at is training our people. Humans are one of the link, weakest links for cybersecurity. So email phishing attacks where people are just clicking on links without unintentionally, the attackers are pretty smart. We can inject malware right into a machine or cause problems. Also social engineering. I think I was on the, coming in the road to, this morning, I heard about the eToll systems. How many of you know, everybody's getting those texts that say, hey, you owe money for your eToll, how about you price the money, send it to us. That's part of social engineering and that's a big threat vector where criminal minds are getting very good at coming in. Um, additionally, is knowing what's on your network. That's another area where it's easy for us to limit the impact is vulnerabilities. How many systems do you have on your network that are running outdated operating systems? Are you, are you making sure that your systems are patched? That's one of the things that internally and externally we work with our customers to make sure that they do an assessment to validate that they know what their inventory is and what's going on. One of the new areas, and, and you kind of alluded to, is, is the internet, net, internet of Things. Look around you, everything's connected. I mean, this monitor's probably connected to the network. There's other things connected to the network. These type of non-traditional devices that are connected to our network don't always necessarily have the, the same level of security as a typical <coughs> desktop server or anything else. And that's becoming a growing problem as people need to make sure they're aware what is sitting on their network and what access it has to the internet and who's connecting to these devices. Even your local vendor machine that's sitting on your network where third parties coming in to service, are you making sure that that vending machine doesn't have access to the rest of your network? Um, another area where it's, it's really emerging is the cloud. People are really looking around, how can they deploy faster, quicker, and going to the cloud. Often they're avoiding IT and doing it themselves. And that's a real problem is making sure that the data that's up there within the Microsoft Cloud, AWS, and Google is actually protected does it have the same level of security controls and have the people implemented those solutions to understand what impact they have? Is their data being advertised externally to the world? Are the identities that they're using to connect to the cloud being shared to third parties without their knowledge? So that's another area that we're seeing a lot of focus that we're looking at. You mentioned insider risk. Again, that's, that's always a big area, making sure that you have a proper data loss prevention policy, that when people are either leaving your company or people are working for you, you know how they're shifting that data around your company? Are they shifting it out of, out of your workplace? Is it confidential data? Are you aware of that data leaving you? And, and finally, there's a third party risk, making sure that your supply chain is fully intact, knowing that each of your suppliers, each of your vendors are apply, applying to the same level of security that you expect and that you have the contracts in place so you have the oversight there. And we'll come back to supply chain risk in a while, I think. Okay. Katrina, so we're, we're escalating up. Um, what do countries worry about and how are countries reacting to these kinds of emerging threats? Great, yeah. So the angle I'm going to come in on is kind of the international security piece, so state on state activity. Um, and here uh, I'm going to take a slightly different approach uh, to, to our fellow speakers. Um, what you'll find or what we're seeing is that um, uh, at the UN level, so global level, uh, there is a, the beginning of a consensus on what states, all states, including Ireland, view as malicious 
state activity. Um, uh, so just uh, in terms of where you uh, might find more information on this or where we're parking this, it's effectively first committee uh, on disarmament and uh, ICT questions relating to international security. So that's the, the kind of the space we're talking about. Um, so as I said, uh, there is the beginning of a consensus uh, on the nature of uh, what we call the cyber threat environment. Um, and uh, I, I guess not news to, to anybody here on the panel, but, but the nature of cyber and uh, tech, new technology issues like AI is that they're probably two of the most cross-cutting uh, areas that uh, any of us have ever ha have come across vis-a-vis uh, -vis traditional security disciplines. So uh, generally, when, when, when states are negotiating these types of issues and trying to understand the kind of the, the existing and the emerging threat landscape, um, there's a combination of what we can describe as persistent threats um, that, that have been around for quite a long time, but also emerging issues that are constantly challenging, um, which are, by their very nature, um, destabilizing to the international security environment. So, so uh, just to give you some practical examples, because um, I think that's uh, always quite helpful, vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis malicious use of cyber capabilities by states. So again, I just want to kind of emphasize that, that, that space I'm coming in at. Um, by all accounts, uh, all UN um, 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 member states so, uh, within, from the General Assembly uh, have agreed that there is an increase in what we call scale, severity, and sophistication um, of these activities. Uh, a number of states um, uh, are developing out uh, capabilities for military purposes and the use of cyber in future conflicts is becoming more likely. I'll give you two to, to three more examples just to give you a sense of exactly what we're talking about. Um, there is an increase, and this is actually relatively new compared to say the threat landscape uh, 10 or so years ago. There's an increase in states' malicious use of what we call cyber-enabled covert information campaigns which aim to influence the process, the systems, and the overall stability of another state. So you can imagine how this could potentially be escalatory to this kind of stable, peaceful international security environment. Uh, we have, uh, of course, many experts here would be aware of kind of the increasing seriousness of the risk to uh, critical infrastructure. Um, and uh, another aspect that's relatively new and um, I, I believe untapped with respect to our understanding of uh, where we're going in the next five to ten years are the new and emerging technology issues uh, in this space of state-on-state -state activity, uh, nefarious activity, which can potentially expand the attack surface. And lastly, um, this might sound unusual, but it's important to, to, to raise. Um, states across the world are concerned, and they do specifically cite this as um, uh, an existing threat within the threat landscape piece. The capacities and resources of states across the world um, are different, they, they vary. And what this means is that it increases, increases risks for all states, including a state like Ireland. So that's something that we worry about regularly. So thank you. It's an asymmetric risk question. I think we, we can come back to some of those issues again in a moment. But before we, we dive into the specificities, we have a shooting war underway in Europe at the moment. And I've seen a significant amount of, uh, of cyber tools deployed as part of that military campaign. General White, um, from your military perspective, what do you think the major lessons are from that, that military campaign? Okay, so uh, I, I suppose from a mili military perspective, um, we had the, um, the Russian War of Aggression, which uh, commenced, as, as we know, uh, last February. Um, and I suppose all of us in this panel, and mostly everyone in the audience, uh, are very well, well aware that the issue of cyber attacks uh, directed against Ukrainian infrastructure and public bodies has been a, a feature throughout, throughout the conflict. Um, you know, what is the situation of the military with regard to that? So, you know, key critical military functions, uh, you know, particularly of, of the Ukrainian military, but also militaries throughout Europe, uh, are increasingly dependent on, on uh, ensured and assured access to networks. So information assurance becomes a key factor, actually, uh, in, in, in this area, you know, do you trust the information that you're receiving from your networks? Because at the end of the day, you must be able to trust your information in order to plan and in order to conduct your operations, which in turn leads to force protection for, for your, your troops on the ground. Again, we have observed that the, the military um, are increasingly dependent on uh, civilian critical infrastructure, and you, you've mentioned that in, in your, your, your opening uh, opening uh, a few words there, and also on um, civilian services. Um, 
there's a constant growth and a constant development in the type of networks we're using. Uh, we heard about the Internet of Things and connected devices, uh, all of which, um, from a military perspective, we assess as a threat all the time because we have to. So, you know, you, you look at your connected watch, uh, you look at your uh, fridge in a social room, uh, if it's connected to a network, is that giving off a geolocation device? Is it going to compromise uh, your troops on the ground? Is it going to give away your position? Um, we have we have seen rapid software development over the course of the uh, the um, the the last number of months in Ukraine, uh, with new threats and new vulnerabilities arising on, on literally nearly on a daily basis. One other key feature that we have observed as well is particular emphasis on on, on the storage and the, class, the classification of nation state data. Uh, we know at one stage that the um, the, the key Ukrainian data, you know, where, where, where is that going to be located? Or indeed for any state, where, where, where is it going to be located? You know, do we look at a cloud model? Do we look at it off-site? Do we look at it in another country? So on and so forth. I mean, it's, 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 it's something to think about. Um, so we can assess that in this conflict and most likely f future conflicts, cyber attacks will become a ubiquitous and routine feature and could potentially lead to further unintended consequences such as we observed with the KA satellite attack. So it was ostensibly against the Ukrainian military, but it did have downstream effects against um, um, wind power turbines in Germany and, and, and certain other areas. So as I, as I said earlier, a key lesson from, from, from the war, war really is the segregation of military and civilian infrastructure, potentially to avoid be better security for military and civilian networks. However, having said that, the interdependency between physical and digital infrastructure and the potential for significant cyber security incidents to disrupt or damage critical infrastructure is high, and at the time illustrated that the EU needs closer military and civilian cooperation in cyberspace to become a stronger security provider for its citizens. <clears throat> and as a result of that, the, uh, the net result was the, galvan the, the EU galvanised its response at a policy and operational level um, uh, to come up with, with two key documents. And those key documents are the uh, Strategic Compass for Security and Defence, which probably most members of the audience uh, uh, have heard. But it's, it's a key framework document, uh, certainly for, for our work. And then the European um, Cybersecurity Policy. And at the policy level, uh, this document, which was published by the um, European External Action Service, placed an increased emphasis on cyber defence. It led to the joint declaration in November 22 uh, on cyber defence, with the resultant ratification uh, by the European Council on the 22nd of May this year. Um, our work is framed by this. Uh, I, I think as I look at the uh, cyber defence policies, there's over 60 different references to uh, military, civil, uh, cooperation, collaboration. So I think as, as we move forward, that's a key feature of, of the cyber security landscape. Absolutely. I mean, ex just on exactly that, um, one of the key learnings that from, from the civilian cybersecurity side was the dependence on civilian, often not obviously critical infrastructure of military forces to project power and to defend their citizens. Mm -hmm. I'll give you another case in point. This might be um, slightly surprising. One of the first things our Ukrainian friends did on the civilian side was they took all of their government data and they took it straight out of Ukraine and they placed it into a third country in Europe, not here, closer to then. Um, and they did, did that for two reasons. One, they were worried about cyber attack. But two, they were worried about their data centers being hit by cruise missiles. So cyber has a kinetic component as well in the, in the military context. Chris, from a UK perspective, well, and looking at this, looking at the, the, the lessons from the war in Ukraine, and staying on that for a moment, we know the Russians have had conducted at least 10, maybe 11 separate wiper attacks on Ukrainian civilian infrastructure. We know there's an ongoing progressive attritional campaign in cyberspace. Is it working? Well, I think, I, I think it's too early to say. It's a, it's, this, this is going to last years, in my view. Um, and the threat will evolve and change. But I was going to, I was going to start my, my response by saying it's probably extremely unwise to pick a fight with a general. <laughs> but, but just in response to the comment about being able to separate civilian and military systems, if you take something like Ireland's air traffic management system, it's totally dual use, and you can't have one without the other. And if they didn't integrate tightly, you wouldn't be able to do either. And I think lots of infrastructure, especially from a UK perspective, our adversaries, let's talk you know, China, Russia, and, and I know there's lots of politics here. I'm not a politician, I'm a technical person. 
but they regard things like air traffic management as entirely dual use. And, you, uh, and the integration of technology means increasingly that the infrastructure that we rely on is dual use. The energy system, the water system, having effects on that affects the military just as it affects the total population. And also, given some of the politics that's gone on this morning, I, I didn't want to say what the lessons are from the UK, but instead I'll, I'll tell you what I care about. So just look at the person next to you, will you? I know quite a few of your engineers, so that might be socially difficult, but... <laughs> <laughs> just, just, right, do you, do, you, do you think that they secure their machines adequately, that they use unguessable passwords and update the software regularly? I mean, the thing I care about is that cybersecurity is not the responsibility of the people at the front. It's the responsibility of everybody in that audience. It's a whole-of-society problem. And what that means from the north of these islands is that we depend on you and you depend on us. And, and cybersecurity has to be, and this is not a political point, this is a technical point, it has to be an all-island problem, given the amount that we rely on each other. Um, Another point I would make is that we need to protect our kids. This problem, like the Ukraine, is not going away in my lifetime, and, I, and, and even the younger ones in the audience, it's not going away in yours. So how do we protect our kids? Well, the all of society approach has to look at politicians, because I think we need to ed ed educate the political class so that we make the right decisions now. When we bar like Ireland, your infrastructure is, is flourishing. You know, all over this country, there are, there are you know, massive investments that bring services to people, but they're going to be around for your, for your grandchildren's era. They've been built well, but, but that means that the cybersecurity of those infrastructures has to be a continual care for everybody in this room. And if, if people make the incorrect decisions now, it won't be necessarily this generation that suffers, it will be the next, especially in critical national infrastructures. And if I do bring a bit of politics in, it, it, it's likely that the people that suffer worse from cyber attacks on critical national infrastructures are the disadvantaged. Those that have resources can pay to restore their services, can go private on the healthcare <laughs> systems and things like that. So cyber security is not a technical concern. It, it's not just a political concern, it's a social concern. Um, I think I've said enough now. Mm, okay, thank you. I, <laughs> I mean, there's a few things in there to pick up on. On the north-south one, I think that's really important. People are probably aware, but we have a north-south electricity grid, so it's a shared grid on the island, and we have a north-south gas grid, which is yeah. a shared grid on the island. So they're utterly interdependent. Um, we have a number of different information sharing relationships with our UK colleagues, north, south and east, west. Many of the politicians in the north don't realise how interconnected we are, which is probably a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. Um, <laughs> But we are, we are acutely conscious of the need to, to protect those and to protect those at a, at a governmental level, east, west and north, south, local and national level. Um, we have yeah. two overt um, information sharing bodies, an all our information exchange, and what's called a C3WG, I'm not going to try and set it out, um, which looks at cybersecurity inf information sharing, response, preparedness, and incident response. General, you want to come Yeah, back? no, I'm, I'm just going to come back with it, back at you at Chris. But yeah. <laughs> um, Absolutely agree. Julius, Julius technology is, is, is pervasive out there, but the, the, there are situations where um, you have to have uh, actual control of systems for yourself. And maybe I can. I'm really sorry I said I can, that now. No, 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 no. <laughs> I can talk about it later, perhaps, but it's, uh, there's one particular PESCO project we can talk about a, a European Security Command and Control System. And for military operations, uh, it's called EU MILCOM. Um, it's a very interesting um, PESCO project which has been coordinated by Spain and other European Union member states. Um, but it's, it's one example of, of where there needs to be segregation of, of uh, military systems because you do not do military planning using Microsoft Word, PowerPoint and Excel. You do not. Because you have such a range of functions, you have a cross-cultural collaboration mechanism that, that is not served by those platforms. And I'm not picking on Microsoft. <laughs> Um, so just really quickly to explain, from a, from a military perspective, cybersecurity is really about force protection. 
Yes. It's about ensuring you can continue to do your military job. Um, and this piece, this question, and you're looking at a culture clash here. Uh, certainly, right? certainly from our focus where we sit, you know, given that we have Irish, Irish uh, um, personnel and other EU member states there as well. And I, it goes back, I suppose, to the, the, the difference perhaps between cyber security and cyber defence, which perhaps we can, we can touch on maybe later on. Absolutely. Katrina. Great, yeah, I just wanted to jump in on the, the VSAT um, conversation um, and just to kind of raise the point about the complexity really arising from that. Um, you know, at a time of, of, of what we can describe as armed conflict, um, Russia's intentional operation against VSAT, um, uh, what is curious, and I think uh, General White was, was speaking to, is uh, the unexpected spillover effects that occurred um, within EU member states. Um, uh, and I would say unexpected on, on all sides. Um, and just bear in mind, some of these EU member states are, are members of NATO too. So the key question, I guess, for the, uh, when I put on that kind of um, uh, um, kind of the cyber diplomacy hat, so to speak, is how do you then avoid an escalation um, in that situation? And what are the standards? So the difference between the type of peacetime standards I was describing versus, well, in a time of war, um, a different kind of uh, legal standards uh, kick in. So I just wanted to kind of speak to that um, as well. So thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. I think there, there is obviously in the middle of all of this a really inter interesting question about legitimate targeting um, in, in times of in war times and of war, in times correct. of peace. And that, there's an international law question there which gets very complex and messy very quickly. Bob? I was just going to mention just on the, the, the Ukraine, uh, we got mentioned there that obviously the, the kind of kinetic part of the war kind of started when tanks roll into the, the country, but the actual online version of the war has been going on essentially non-stop for years, right? If you talk about, es if you consider espionage as kind of part of that. And, and destructive attacks. And destructive attacks. And even in the days leading up to just before the actual troops cross the border, there was a heavy escalation in terms of attacks and some of the first wipers and things that we, we saw about, if you look at the timeline, happened a day or two in advance of the actual crossing of the border. And if there is at some point, hopefully in the future, uh, peace treaties and things like that, they will continue after that as well because it doesn't have the same kind of policing on what happens in that space as we do in, in purely military. So. Yeah. Um, is it Oh, absolutely. So, uh, yeah. Sorry, we have, we have to be very careful not to... Yes, yeah. stop me any time I talk in techno jargon. So, essentially, it's a program, uh, gets installed on computer system, right, or normally a network, and the idea is to simply disable it, right, to delete everything, make it unusable. So, it's essentially if you have uh, computers running a hospital or power plant or anything else, and they're no longer working, then it's essentially offline. So it does what, that's what a wiper attack aims to do. Yeah. And like we said, there's 10 or 11 ways of those in Ukraine in the last while. So while we're talking about technological change, um, obviously technology keeps changing. We're looking now at the development of AI models and the promulgation and democratization of these models. Starting at the other end, Chris, what comes next in technological terms? What are the, the forthcoming risks in cyber? You want my list? <laughs> I get that a lot. Well, I, I, I think many of the things that are in the Irish uh, risk assessment are are well thought through. So I think you're in good shape in terms of many of the many of the potential risks. I think some of the things that worry me are um, an, a variation of ransomware, and of course this is live streamed, so you have to be quite careful. You don't inspire people, but but I mean, ransomware itself is 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 very dumb. Um, and very, you know, it's very simplistic in its thinking. Um, tampering is a bit more of a concern where you don't exfiltrate or encrypt the data, but you alter values to the extent where nobody actually trusts the data anymore. So specifically, if somebody were to alter or edit the flight plan within the Irish aviation system, one determined small change would undermine confidence in an entire system. So I think a variation on ransomware that involves tampering is something that I worry about. I worry about, much like I've said with the growth of Irish infrastructure, I think I would be extremely sensitive about renewables. I would, re because there's such a pressure on achieving the uh, sustainable development goals that those companies are investing really, really rapidly and the country is relying on those companies so far, so much for its energy future that that absolutely has to be front and centre. And, and you and I had a discussion offline as well about both maritime and agriculture. I think the introduce, introduction of information technology is exponentially fast in those areas. And again, 
those rapid changes, I think, aren't, aren't necessarily being secured to the extent that, that, that I would like. There are other things that we could bring up, like uh, specifically cybersecurity and machine learning algorithms. Um, for those of you that are interested in that, a more technical, uh, if you look up the MITRE ATLAS taxonomy, that will give you a list of potential attacks on machine learning algorithms. Which I think nationally across, across Ireland, it would be useful to point people at that uh, so that you're not bringing in algorithms that are inherently insecure. I think, uh, again, for Irish companies, I would be really concerned. Something we've mentioned, you and I have mentioned previously, is, is post-quantum. So many agencies around the world are storing large amounts of data, which at the moment is encrypted. If quantum facilities are available, that store of potentially sen extremely sensitive data would be amenable to, to, to quantum decryption. Um, I don't know, there's lots more we could go through, but I, I don't want to be depressive. Let me say something more positive, right? I, I mean, one of the things that I would stress more, coming here from the, from the north, I think it's really important to look at the next generation of cybersecurity professionals in this country and really encourage and motivate the people that will defend me when I retire. <laughs> yeah, because I, I want the very best minds to be working in this area because the risks of not doing that are incredibly, you know, incredibly serious. Absolutely. So invest in the young. Yeah. Let's come back to skills in a second. I mean, right. Just on, on you, you raised two questions there. Um, renewables, I think, is an absolute given. Yeah. Um, and we can talk later on about exactly what we're doing on renewable let, space. Let me give you an idea about that. So, so what's happening across these islands is the, uh, a move to high voltage direct current cables, yeah. which reduce the levels of redundancy that you've got and massively increases the consequence of any compromise. And you know, there are areas like that structurally within the engineering of critical infrastructures in these islands, which require significant scrutiny um, because of the potential impact on, on a national energy stability. Let me just give you an idea of what the consequences are. I worked for the European Commission on the consequences of blackouts in Italy and in North America. Italy suffered a voltage instability, which meant that their national grid started to, to collapse. 60,000 people were trapped on trains. So most of the emergency services were instantly taken up with rescuing those people. The hospitals were closed. People in the community who relied on healthcare in the home no longer had infusion devices and other pumps. All of the uh, street lighting systems and the, and, the, and the, you know, so this is not science fiction or apocalypse now. You can use these as training examples of the consequences of some of the things that I've discussed that could be triggered by an HVDC attack. Yeah. Well, I mean, last year when we did a, a full up national exercise of our national yeah. cyber incident response plan, we did it on the energy sector for exactly these reasons. Brilliant. And we looked at supply chain incidents as a key component of that. In other yeah. words, and not just physical supply chain, but people providing services to critical infrastructure, which yeah. is a, a challenge that people don't often think of. Yeah. People buy services now, so you don't actually know who's working on your systems quite often. Access control, physical security all become much more complex. This is a whole of society problem. Absolutely. Right. Just two things really quickly, sorry, General. And yeah. then, so we published two documents in the last while. One was on public procurement and cybersecurity requirements that public officials should be taking when they're procuring any IT service or good for some of those same reasons. Um, and it refers to ML and so on, but obviously it's going to need to be updated continually to deal with GPT 5, 6, and 7, and so on. Secondly, we also published yesterday, a, or government did rather, a national risk assessment on cybersecurity issues, which you referred to already. Yeah. And this calls out all of these issues in great depth, um, and is the result of about 18 months worth of work on our part, colleagues in the Defence Forces, the Guardi, and elsewhere as well. So. Please, everyone, read it. It's a great document. <laughs> Seriously, it's really yeah. good. I didn't write any of it. That's why it's good. Um, <laughs> Bob, you wanted to come in. Yeah, I was just going to point out, just when we talk about technology changes, and we can get into individual ones like AI or quantum and so on, but it's interesting that if you, if you basically chart out like uh, generational changes in technology, so you're talking about like the printing press and then typewriters and then internet and email and so on, and when you start graphing those out, it gets exponentially faster. So the, the time between these like massive generationally shifting technologies gets shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. And humans are terrible at noticing those things. It's a bit like during COVID times where you would have seen you, you know, the numbers on one day are 500 and the next day they're 1,000 and the next day they're 2,000. And you don't, it seems incremental, but when you look back, you realize you're in this like exponential curve, right? And what people often do when it comes to technology because it moves so quickly, even for those of us who work in this field every day, is it's simple to tune in and say, I'm going to ignore that because it's moving too quickly 
and you know it's not my problem, I'll come back to it. And by the time you do come back and look at it, it's gone so much further because you can't stop. You have to try to get ahead of this at all times. Um, so no matter how fast you think you're running, it's almost never fast enough. But I'll, I'll echo what Kieran said, is it's generally positive change. Most of these make our lives better. Some of them have scary scenarios to go with them, but what doesn't get talked about enough is the very positive things that come with all of those technologies. Katrina. Great. And then Richard and then yeah. Sean. Sorry. It's going to take a while. Sorry, go ahead. This is wonderful because now I'm going to give um, uh, everyone else their homework. Uh, I actually have a piece out today and it's a slightly different angle, but I think a major policy gap, um, um, which is really important going forward uh, in terms of that kind of policy underpinning to this space of the cyber nexus with what we call EDTs, so emerging and disruptive technologies. Um, so I think trying to get that kind of strong policy foundation piece um, uh, put together from a security and defence perspective. So there are lots of national AI strategies, for example, but, but trying to figure out the security and defence implications um, are, are, are really pertinent, and not just at national level, but also regional and um, that global UN level that I described. And just uh, my wish list, uh, I think, if, if we were to go about this um, uh, in terms of a methodology that we're starting to see developing out at the EU, but also in other regional uh, forums like NATO, um, is to first consider developing out uh, like an overarching strategy, like how do we deal with emerging and disruptive technologies broadly understood vis-a-vis -vis security and defence. Um, so once you get that kind of structured sense of, of the space we're in, because there is so much technological uncertainty, but there's also a vast amount of uh, 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 analytical uncertainty at the same time. So combined, uh, I think getting that kind of overarching sense of where we're going would be helpful. And then from there, building out, okay, how do we deal with AI from a security and defence perspective, including the cyber nexus? How do we deal with quantum matters uh, and so on and so forth? So there's like, there may be up to 10 to 15 uh, EDTs, so to speak, uh, to run through. So again, without giving anybody their homework, or, uh, I'd love to do this myself, but uh, trying to prioritise which of the emerging and disruptive technologies, including the cyber aspects, uh, need to be dealt with and, and really, really understood carefully now. So that's my Great. perfect timing. Thank you, Richard. Thanks, <laughs> Richard, and then Sean, and then we move on to the next topic quickly. We're okay, yeah, real, real quick, quick. A, a new buzzwords, if you haven't already heard, just start hearing about zero trust. So zero trust is the idea that you, you identify everything on your network, but trust nothing. And that's something, a new change that, whilst the concept's been around for a long time, what we're starting to see is the technologies really catch up and a lot of collaboration with much of the security companies working with technology companies to implement this new phase of, of zero trust. And I'll, I'll keep it short and simple there, so a little homework for you, for everyone to look up. Yeah. And again, I'll just touch on a, on a, on a point um, on, on Chris as well. I'm not picking on Chris at all. Um, uh, he, Get your own he, back. He just, <laughs> he just mentioned a point there about, um, um, I, I think he mentioned about the, uh, the trains or, or the blackouts or whatever on, on the yeah. transportation network. Uh, uh, another um, project that, that we work on uh, in, in my directorate and in consultation with the concepts and capability directorate in the military staff is, is, is the concept of military mobility. Uh, we, have, we have seen this in, in, in um, it's, it's, it's not so much prevalent for Ireland, but certainly in continental Europe with train systems, with uh, road systems and so on and so forth. You know, in the event of a significant crisis where you need to get uh, military stores to a particular location quickly, unhindered, in, unimpeded, you know, a cyber attack on a switching system in Frankfurt or Hamburg or in Rotterdam port or somewhere like that could have major consequences for getting military equipment to a particular location in time. So again, the overall military planning and operational planning, it's, it's a significant factor as well. Absolutely. It's a source of additional friction. Um, while you're at the floor, General, we'll change topic really quickly and talk about EU and NATO institutional developments. Okay. So you framed this really, really briefly earlier on, but just for, for everybody's sake and to explain what's happening at, at European level writ large, what's NATO doing, what's the European Union doing on this? Okay, so I, I, I suppose the, um, from the policy imperative within the European Union, the, the, uh, the European uh, cyber defence policy is, is the really big issue at the moment. And uh, again, I understand, you know, that it's, it's the implementation of that is going to be discussed in the next number of weeks. Um, one of the key components coming out of that is, is what's known as a, an EU Cyber Defence Coordination Centre. And this is going to be a repository of information for information sharing among the defence community 
within the European Union. Um, and in addition to that, uh, because of the, uh, the number of civilian missions uh, as well, the information is intended to be there. Now, there is a PESCO project which is ongoing at the moment. Um, it's called the CIDCC project. It's, um, it's being coordinated by Germany's Cyber Information Domain Coordination Center. And that has been viewed as the, um, the use case uh, for the eventual transition to the work that is going to begin on the EU cyber defense policy. And that's a really interesting and promising um, uh, project at the moment. Um, that's just one, one area. Um, another area that we work on, particularly with NATO, and the collaboration with NATO at the staff-to-staff -staff level at which I work at, goes back to the initial joint declaration in 2016 and subsequent joint declarations thereafter. And it includes uh, collaboration, exchange of concepts, um, um, lecturing, uh, working with the European Security and Defence College, uh, working with the NATO school in Oberammergau, and participation in um, cyber defence exercises such as um, Cyber Phalanx, which is a, a, an exercise run by the European Defence Agency for military planners in the area of cyber defence. Uh, there is also Exercise Locked Shields, which is run by the, uh, the NATO, um, the Talent Centre of Excellence, CCDOE. Again, it's the largest cyber exercise in the world, and uh, it has really good potential for both military forces and, and um, uh, others to become involved in. And uh, this week, uh, there are members of my staff, international staff, who are in um, the um, Joint Forces Training Centre in Poland working on a, an exercise called Coalition Warrior Interoperability Exercise. So there's a lot of, of work going on there with the ultimate aim of having secure connected networks, ultimately leading to confidence in the information that you're transmitting and ultimately leading to force protection for your troops on the ground. So that's very briefly just what, what's, what's going on there at the moment. At a very high level. I mean, the key point here is if nothing else works, the military has to work. Yeah. That's the key question. So there's a question come in on, on, on Slido, which I think is probably best directed immediately at you as well, General. It's on strategic compass. Yeah. Um, and the question really is, how effective do you believe this will be? And do you, do you believe it will protect Ireland given the amount of cyber industry we have? You know, from where I'm sitting at the moment, I, I, I think it will be very effective because I think the first thing that came out of that, actually, once the strategic compass was published in, in, um, in, in March of last year, that was followed very quickly afterwards by the joint declaration with the EU cybersecurity uh, policy on the 10th of November. So a lot of work between my directorate, between the European External Action Service, between the European Defence Agency. So there is a huge amount of work going on with that at the moment. And with the ratification by the Council of Ministers on the 22nd of May and an implementation plan in place at the moment. You can see the pace of, of, of work on this at the moment. So the question is there, is it? I can't see the question there now, but there's a huge amount of work going on in this and industry will, will, will no doubt be very much involved in this, I think, as Absolutely. well. I mean, there's a, there's a point here in that there's always a lag, obviously, between the European Union making a decision and it's yeah. starting to manifest itself at a national level. Yeah. But when it happens, it happens with pace. We'll yeah. come back to the question in a moment about what's happened since HSC on the same basis. Chris, you wanted to come in? Yeah, I was just going to pose some difficult questions, I think. Um, I think within 10 years, it will be almost impossible to to buy high-level munitions without machine learning embedded in them. Um, when I moved to Belfast, I was asked to take part in a UK Ministry of Defence project on machine learning in weapon systems. And the role, I, I didn't want to get involved because of all the hype that's around it, but um, they asked me to be responsible for ethics. And I see both safety and security as subcomponents of ethics. And so within this context, you have to ask yourself, does neutrality provide you with sufficient defense against adversaries that are equipped with those sorts of weapons? And if, if not, then what are you going to ask your 18, 19 year old men and women to do? So things like the, the compass and other things need to be really scrutinized within the changes that we see both technologically and socially and also politically in the aftermath of Ukraine. And, and I do think that the military around the world need to radically rethink what the future of warfare and foreign policy will be like. If I was south of the border, I would not be confident, given what I see around me today. And that's not to stigmatize any other country, but I wouldn't want my kids to be put in that position. 
as the global debate around artificial intelligence continues to develop, the ethics and military and, and other intelligence and security related uses of AI is be, going to be at the forefront of it. The EU Cyber Act has ethics firmly embedded in it, but it doesn't cover the military citizens. Let me, let me give you a really specific example. So one of the ethical principles that both UK and US is concerned with is um, discrimination. And discrimination means that you should never target a non-combatant. What I, one of the parts of the things I had to do was say, what does that mean to an engineer? What does that really mean in the engineering of a weapon system? A non-combatant isn't, isn't a civilian. It could also be an, a member of enemy forces in the process of, of surrender. So technically what that means is that your machine learning algorithm has to be able to determine intention. And, and to me, that's what safety and security and ethics are all about. They're, they're, they're posing challenges of the technology to do the right thing. And if you do the right thing, you should have confidence to put together systems and, 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 and applications that will, that will protect society. And that's not just true of military systems. It's also true of things like use of machine learning in the allocation of mortgages and, and Absolutely. so forth. And that, that bias question, ultimately, at an international level, is a treaty-type question, I would imagine, in due course. Yeah. Do you want to come with that? Yeah, I think I can add a little bit of a... a um um, a narrative surrounding that in terms of uh, some of the state negotiations. So some of you might be aware um, that, uh, that there's a, um, a very large debate surrounding the military um, uh, uh, responsibility in its uh, uses of AI. And uh, only this February, um, the, the government of the, the Netherlands and the Republic of Korea co-hosted a um, a major summit in the, in the Netherlands on this very topic alone. So it covered a, a vast array of topics. I mean, a three to four day discussion on so many different aspects of this, including um, uh, ethics matters. But just, just to give you a sense of where it's going, uh, there is a new global commission is due to be established to explore these types of questions. Um, a joint declaration was put out at the time. Now, all EU member states uh, did sign that declaration, except for Ireland and Austria. Uh, so you might, I, I'm sure you can access that online, it's publicly available. Um, and the State Department has also put out a, a political declaration um, uh, trying to uh, promote uh, kind of a, a norm, so to speak, a rule of the road, that um, these types of new technologies where uh, AI-enabled um, uh, activity can't be used um, uh, with respect to decisions surrounding, say, nuclear um, uh, capability and so forth. So, so there's a lot of uncharted territory analytically that hasn't been quite decided upon yet. So I think, I hope that speaks uh, to some of your issues. I, mean, I think the, the key point from my perspective on AI is the, the ramifications of this are so broad and so deep that it will take right. years of, of action and before ramifying is fully understood. I don't think we've got that amount of time. There are weapons it's like directed energy weapon systems that can only really effectively be deployed with the assistance of machine learning. If you decide not to use them, that's, that's going to put your 18 and 19 year olds in a very difficult position. And the Absolutely. policy is light years behind the technology, yeah. basically. And the technology will continue to develop much faster Correct. than the policy can, given yeah. the nature of things. There's two questions that have come in, and I'll, I'll take them both together. One, and it's, uh, it is 16 votes, so I'll touch on it. The question is, to what extent is it systematic underfunding of public services and deprioritization of IT within public sector organizations that leaves them particularly vulnerable to cyber attacks? Sounds to me like a question for Bob and maybe Richard. Bob, do you want to go first? Um, yeah, so, so just on that one, I think this is actually one thing that kind of annoys me a lot when I see these when, when there's a victim of attack, be it the HSE or MTU or whichever ransomware of the week that, that hits something today, uh, we tend to point to the, it's, it's weird, it only happens in cybercrime, we point to the victim and we say, you didn't do your job well enough. Whereas in every other crime, if you walk down the street at night and you, you know, you maybe go down a bad alley to get home faster and somebody mugs you or stabs you, we don't say it was your fault for walking down that street. We blame the person who had the knife, right? And in cybercrime, we almost never blame the person who actually carried out the attack. Or in a lot of cases where it's systemic, where it's always coming from the same countries over and over again, and their departments of justice have no intention of doing anything about it. At that point, you know, if it's one person doing it, not really the state's fault, right? It's an individual. But if it's systemic, then it is. The state has to take some level of responsibility for allowing it to happen. So, yeah, of course, um, public sector and so on, you, there could be more resources, more funding, but we shouldn't always blame the victims for being targeted by people who are career criminals, career espionage, and so on. Yeah. Uh, Richard? Yeah, I think whether it's the government or a private company, everyone has to do a risk assessment. You really need to look at, you can spend infinite money 
on your IT systems and your security systems. So it's all about looking at the risk you have and how much money you want to put towards to buy down that risk. So maybe spending $100,000 saves you $5,000. Spending $10 million saves you $200 million. Those are the type of discussions you need to have is have a third party assessment. I think for the government, they've actually done that and start looking at how much money do we pump in to actually buy down the risk. And that, that tells you if you're actually spending enough money or not. But it's, it's not a simple question of just throw money at it. It's all about a risk, risk cost. Okay. We take some questions from, from the floor in a second, but on, on exactly that question, this is really about resilience. And how resilient do you want to be? I think the most important question for organizations, whether you're a public sector or a private sector, is that you've actually consciously made that decision and you're not just flying blind. But in all honesty, and we've seen it all over the world, no matter how well prepared you are, no matter how resilient you are, sooner or later somebody will get through. That's how this works. Mm -hmm. and, and at that point, it's not the victim's fault. Right, and that's, that's, that's where it goes back to, what's your recovery plan? Do you have an actual plan who to call? And also, how are you securing your, your information? Well, I mean, on exactly that, and to go, to go back to Chris's point about critical infrastructure, the system we use here for, for monitoring and, and regulating, if you like, the resiliency of critical infrastructure has the five points in it. Protect, detect, understand, and then be able to recover. So it is the full five points of the NIST cybersecurity framework, and it is based on reducing risk to services and individuals at every turn. Um, okay, so we've two questions here and one question there. We'll start at the back on the left first. Hi, thank you. Richard Curran. Um, I'm, I'm retired and uh, I, I got away scathed security officer. Um, so I worked, uh, I ran Intel's security and cyber business for the last uh, eight or nine years. I was involved in a lot of military and government security as well as uh, in the cyber. And uh, initiated the um, JSARC, which is Joint Security and Resilience Centre in the Home Office in the UK. So, in looking at collaboration between industry and, and, uh, and security. I've often stood on stage many, many times talking to the audience, and there's a fine line between talking about the opportunity around cyber and frightening the living daylights out of them. And I think from what I heard so far is some of the challenges associated and the types of threats and risks that are in the market. I think I would go back, I think Chris commented on it. I think we should, as, as a country and as a government and, 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 and people, we should strive to be the best country to do business with and the best country to live in. And cyber needs to be integrated into the fabric of our society, all the way up from kindergarten, all the way, all the way up into, into industry. There needs to be an, a, a lot tighter sense of responsibility from critical infrastructure owners, thereby not just providing uh, infrastructure services, but also being accountable. So in the event of, of an attack or an outage, their ability to recover and sustain those levels of services. So I'd like your thoughts on how we need to go about that because you know, I, I was in the business where I was losing some key staff. And I know from you know, some of the engineers I was, I was losing, they were on five times more salary than some of the people employed by the Irish government and through no fault of their own. I think if we look at the future and where it's going around We'll say you mentioned ML. You know, we were looking at systems where we would have people working in operational environments and key infrastructure, where if you weren't authorized or trained to use critical equipment, you weren't able to operate that device. So you're looking at ML as a positive rather than as what these adversaries would get hold of. So I think we need to change the conversation around how to take advantage of Cyper and get away from a technical-based discussion into more of a business and operation and opportunity-based conversation. Thoughts? Okay, so I'll actually start off responding to that. I think we'll have several people who would like to respond. I think, first of all, you're absolutely right. Um, and a key part of the midterm review of our national cybersecurity strategy focuses on exactly those issues. With a bit of luck and the consent of the government next week, thank you, Thonishta, um, that will be published next week. Um, and it'll answer some of those questions, at least. Chris, do you want to go first? Because you're oh, just, You put it much better than me. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> That's all I want to say. General? Yeah, I, I, I'll address the point. Sorry, I've forgotten your name there, John, was it? Richard, Richard sorry. Okay. Um, it's, a, it's a very interesting thing, and it's, it's one which, um, in, in the European setting, when we look at the policies we develop, particularly around, um, okay, so we recognise cyber as a domain of operations for military purposes. Allied to that, then we have um, education process in place for, for our soldiers. Um, and when I say our soldiers, I'm talking that in, in generic terms. But I think we, be, we need to be very cognizant of, of culture, actually. And when we look at, at uh, you know, the vast majority of uh, soldiers in most army these days are young. 
They're extremely tech savvy. They're really, really up to speed on things. So you're absolutely right in that, you know, inculcating a culture of cyber, you know, at, at um, on, on, on an entry into service for any military has a huge positive advantage. And that can only translate itself into society then as well. And it, it's something um, that, that, that I have certainly observed, um, you know, brings huge benefits. But you must capitalise on the cultural aspect of that. You know, I mean, for a young 18, 19 year old, they're so tech savvy, it's incredible. When I see my own, my own kids on that as well, it's just incredible, you know. And you can really build on that because there's an appetite to learn and to move and to, to embrace technology and to embrace every single aspect of that. And there's, there's a further discussion to be had if we have time about skills, particularly both in military and civilian contexts. Um, I'm conscious we have a load of questions. Sorry, question there at the back with the mic and then we'll come along yeah, to the front. This, this for uh, Chris Johnson, probably the rest of the panel. I'm Edward Dixon, just a simple software engineer. You brought up machine learning. Ireland happens to be one of just three countries in the world able to produce the right kind of advanced computer processor to be used in weapon systems. We know that Russian um, weapons manufacturers are trying to source these processors at the moment. Um, is Iron doing enough in terms to think about defense and the kind of chips that we manufacture and where they go? That's a question for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what. Where, where I, great, I mean, great comment, yeah, but you know, I, I think I'll go back to the previous comment about, uh, you know, that just rejoice that you're, you're in that position. These chips are dual purpose, just like it was made before, you know, and, and, and uh, but you have to have, the, what's brilliant about this is that it's asking difficult questions that relate to policy and technology, and that's, but, but what I was trying to do with the comments about the weapon systems was to take you into an area which maybe people are less familiar with and a bit less comfortable with. And I, and, and, but you're asking questions about regulation and morality and, and about industrial policy in a country that I'm not a citizen of. Mm. And, and so these are debates that everybody in this room has to have, not, not me. And I, I can answer that actually specifically. So we have a very robust export control regime. It's administered by our colleagues in the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment. And the usual complaint we get is that it's overly onerous and it doesn't allow people to export who they want to export. There I is can't let them get away with this, right? Because the other side of it, I'm an academic, and the other side of the export control thing is very often you want technology for totally benign purposes and the export control and import control is the, is the absolute devil's work to, 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 to get through. So there's always a that's, that's, few sides that's, to that that's point. That's the point. So and the, the complaint we get from, from third parties is we're overly restrictive. So that's the balance, I suppose. We take two questions at a time. These two gentlemen here at the, at the front. Thank you. Um, Eamon Parker is my name. Uh, no relation to Richard. Um, uh, um, like uh, my neighbor here, I'm a normal person. Um, I, I uh, recently retired teacher of mathematics and information technology. Uh, I, I'd like to draw attention to the imminent disruptive effects of AI on our security and the very fabric of our society. Uh, we're at a point, uh, echoing Bob, we're at the beginning of the exponential curve, for better and for worse. Yesterday, the Joint Oireachtas Committee on Trade, uh, Enterprise <coughs> and Employment held a hearing on uh, AI in the workplace. And I don't think the political representatives present were quite ready for what, I heard, what they heard. I would urge everyone to watch the video. Uh, I think it would be a, a serious wake up and education to, to watch through that video. Um, the disruptive effects, we, we, we may well see quite quickly uh, major disruptions to the workplace, to levels of employment, and those people will need to be prepared and supported by government. This could happen very quickly. Um, uh, so, um, the disruptive effects on um, the information space and the political process, we have seen social media, we have seen nothing yet when AI comes uh, into its own. And we've seen these incredible uh, deep fakes. Um, in the last three months, on two occasions, thousands of the top scientists in the world have issued a warning uh, to the world, to the leaders of the world, about potential existential threats from this technology. 
the response seems to be, from where I am anyway, a deafening silence. Um, so I, I would, I would like you to. I've, I've, I've tried to write this fairly carefully. Just a, a phrase that tries to capture the uh, one aspect of the state of AI today. And I may be corrected on this, but this is evolving so quickly. Just think about the reality of this today. That um, every interest group, every house, every bedroom. Every smartphone in the world that's connected now has conversational, PhD level, ever patient step by step guidance on any topic, dumbed down to your level as much as you desire, for better or for worse. Just imagine the amazing potential of that for education, for health. But just think about the dark side. Thank you. Um, we, 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 yeah, we, yeah. We, I, I, I would just say two things. I, I call on our political leaders to set up a national AI um, monitoring team along the lines of our national health, public health monitoring uh, emergency team during COVID, and that there would be a number of citizens' assemblies to prepare our population for a radically brave new world that needs real leadership. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go straight across. Oh, sorry, one up here and then over there. Hi, um, my name is Victor and uh, uh, I work in finance uh, in Ireland. But uh, decades ago, I am originally from Ukraine and uh, after the full invasion, I was in Ukraine uh, six times. I was on the front line. And I've seen the devastation, uh, like with my own eyes. You know, I was in Bakhmut and uh, and Avdiivka and everything. And um, I do, uh, <clears throat> I know this panel uh, especially is um, not about Ukraine and and the topic of uh, neutrality. But uh, in my view, is this uh, panel is uniquely uh, capable of answering or even thinking about this question that I am about to say. Uh, with the, everything that is going on recently in AI, and assuming, uh, well, hoping it's not going to be uh, as dark side as, uh, as the previous uh, questioner, uh, you know, uh, put it down. And uh, what would the AI answer be to Irish uh, neutrality and uh, <laughs> peace talks? <laughs> I, I also, I also want. I, I also want to. I, I mean, and I and I there hope it's be not one going answer. to be. I hope it's not going to be 42. You know, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, I also want to want to point out that uh, before a large hadron collider was put in place, I mean, how many um, you know um, potential bad uh, things could have happened with the black holes on Earth and everything. So, um, thank you for my choice. Take one more. Thank you. We'll take one more. Hi, my name's Kevin. Um, earlier there today, um, a speaker said, and I'm paraphrasing, the data centers in Ireland make the bigger cyber attack target due to the vast number of them here. Um, there's a massive drain on our energy supply as well, which is also a threat in, in its, its own. Um, I'm just kind of wondering if we can't defend them, why, why are we building them? And why do we need to join or get exit our neutrality you know, if we can't defend them. And then also for Richard Park, Parker of Dell, um, sorry, how important is having data centers based here for multinationals? And how many data centers does Dell have or use in Ireland? I think there's about 4,000 or over in Ireland. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think um, we, we don't have a big geo as far as um, like an Am like Amazon type data center located here. I mean, we have data centers based, uh, we do have our own companies you know, locations, um, but our footprint is not like you would suspect, like one of these data centers 
that they build custom, just full of server racks and everything else. I think that we, we are a digital, t digital economy, so that's something to remember. Um, and I think uh, you, you gotta look at the, the, I know the concern is the power drain and the effects that's gonna have on our energy grid, but those problems are usually solved with technology. And I think there's work already in place to, to look at that. Um, in, in other locations, they may use solar more and wind to power these data centers. Um, and, but, uh, but yes, this is a valid concern and it's something that we gotta look at being a country that is digital based and have a huge footprint with the digital economy where we're going. Yeah. I mean, I, so the, the, the overall number of data centers is, is not that large in Ireland. There are a significant number and they're, they, they're a significant asset, but they're a fundamental part of the digital economy. You don't do internet without cloud anymore. Um, and it's something that's going to become more and more of a thing. Richard, do you want to come in on, on the cloud issue before we go to AI specifically? Yeah, I, I mean, the countries throughout Europe, um, with a small e, um, are concerned not just about all the issues that you've described, but this concept of what's called virtualization, which is that by definition, the way that cloud service providers work is they don't, they don't pay attention to the content that's actually on the data center. And from a customer's point of view, you don't actually know where your data is to the point where some fairly sensitive UK government data was stored in Ireland through the Brexit process. Um, and so the, the, the risk or liability for Ireland as a society is that if, you're, if your data centres are compromised in any way, it's not just Irish data, it could be data of all of your partner countries throughout Europe, including data about their citizens that's compromised as well. And, and technically, it's a really difficult problem and I'm not sure that anybody really knows how to solve it. There is a new uh, proposal from the European Commission that came out last month on certification of cloud service providers for cybersecurity, and, and I would really recommend that the Irish government and, and others within cybersecurity in this country get involved in that process to address some of the concerns that you've had. Because uh, to be honest, you should rejoice that you've got these. <laughs> you know, there's, there's people out there whose, whose jobs and families and mortgages are paid by them. So. You know, don't 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 put them onto into unemployment. And we're we're fully involved in the UCS process, yeah. colleagues. Here, it's, it's are, really good, a really really board. positive thing. Yeah. We set up a new certification team to deal with exactly that, Brilliant. dealing with data centres here. So there was questions on AI. If anybody wants to answer some of those, and we, we've time for two more questions after that. Katrina? Yeah, great. Yeah, I just want to speak to. I'll speak first to that question, and then the AI piece, if that's okay. Just just from my my, my perspective, uh, based on the kind of the, the state activity. Um, the reality is, no matter what the critical infrastructure, whether it's the data centres or, or elsewhere, there's a large volume of state activity during peacetime that's occurring. So, so when we use the word attack in that sense, you know, it can be anything from uh, intrusion to espionage to signalling, all sorts of, of, of activity going on. But the reality is, what we then have to do is enhance our resilience, all the good work that you've been hearing described here on this panel, uh, to underpin a prosperous society. And fundamentally, we have to get on with, with business. So, so that's just to that point. On the AI piece, I think there's a lot of value. Uh, I totally, I, I can see exactly where, where you're coming from with, with your uh, intervention. Uh, it's why I, I described this methodology that's developing vis-a-vis -vis emerging and disruptive technologies broadly understood. And from there, with a security and defence lens, don't forget, um, and from there, uh, then delving into AI and the security and defence aspect. Um, and this um, proposal uh, or suggestion you made um, uh, in terms of what could be, could be done here, in the United States, for example, they set up an AI commission. So, so there are all, all sorts of kind of good examples out there of what, what could be done. Uh, but I do agree that we certainly need to do more now uh, for the, the next few years ahead. And if you don't mind, Richard, just very quickly, I do want to, um, um, uh, if you don't mind, I, I want to argue that actually I do think we should have robust um, uh, controls when it comes to dual use uh, uh, technologies. I understand the argumentation, but I think up-to-date legislation, up-to-date regulation, uh, and that regulatory environment um, will actually help everybody because then at least everybody can get on with their business uh, in, in a safe manner. And that's not 
it's speaking to the export control regime, but it's also speaking to strategic investment screening regimes. We need to know who's buying what in the country, uh, who owns the capability, who's doing it through legitimate or illegitimate means. Uh, and we speak a lot about capability, but it's also the people, the talent, um, a, a, a acquisition of talent, dual use capability, but also IP. So um, I'm going to argue for robust um, uh, uh, regimes in that regard. I don't have any suggestion we'd ever weaken our export control regime. <laughs> so I, could I, I'll actually double up on that, actually, given you know the security risk of you know um, information systems, radio systems, whatever, in a, in a non-permissive environment, uh, whether it's Africa, whether it's um, other countries, you need security. And you know sometimes you cannot rely on, on, on your, your laptop or something like that. You actually have to go back to radios. And particularly in that type of communication, you need your export controls, depending on where you are. And there's also a question, obviously, in due course, about export controls of AI and export controls of cybersecurity systems. We've time for two more questions really quickly. Senator Crockwell, there's one more over here. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, Richard, uh, the National Cybersecurity Centre has introduced a transition year programme in cyber awareness. Chris, based on what you've said today and based on what's happening in Saudi Arabia and India and various other parts of the world, isn't it time that we funded cyber education in national school for 10-year-olds and beyond uh, to bring them into the, the cyber awareness world because we're only as strong as our weakest link? And the second part of, of my question is a lot of talk uh, leading up to this uh, um, forum about a desire by government to enter NATO, etc., etc. There is no such desire. I myself would be opposed to it, but... I, I put this to you, we will have to align ourselves with most of the countries in NATO in order to have a common uh, cyber, um, I suppose, response. Uh, we should be far more open about cyber attacks. We should uh, publicize cyber attacks as soon as they happen. The criminals are getting away with it because when they're at, when a SME, for example, is attacked, they hide the attack rather than admit that it has happened. And as such, maybe seven or eight SMEs will get hit with the same attack. So I'm really all for putting it out in the open. And, and so I'd be interested in all of your comments on that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. We'll take, we'll take two more questions here really quickly, and then we'll, we'll wrap up because we're burning time really fast now. Um, hi. So the system in Ireland and in Northern Ireland was uh, created while both nations were part of the common market. Now, of course, Britain has moved elsewhere. Um, like it or not, and we are still within the common market and outside of NATO. Therefore, an attack by an, a state actor on a, a, the north of Ireland in some te technical capacity would also, is, sorry, is on, sorry, would also hit us due to our connected uh, capacity between, the, between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland when it comes to uh, technology. Um, I'm just wondering uh, what like, does that is our neutrality when it comes to cyber security um, if our two systems, both North and South, are so connected, if, we're, if they're part of NATO and we're not part of NATO? Thank, Thank you. you. And one quick suit behind you. Thanks very much. Um, my name is Rosari Griffin. I'm the director of the Centre for Global Development here at UCC. And every two years, um, I attend the World Science Forum, uh, which most recently was held in South Africa just before uh, Christmas. And one of the sessions, which is always of great interest, is on the weaponization of science and technology. Mm -hmm. And I just want to add a comment to my previous speaker. Um, the threat of AI, um, not alone to the higher education sector, which is becoming more and more apparent, you know, getting the technology to deal with uh, AI, but also to humanity, as the previous speaker mentioned. Um, and what worried me really today is a comment from the panel um, was that gov uh, government policy is light years behind where the technology is at. And we need, you know, we need to keep abreast of it in terms of ethics and committees. And Katrina made reference to this, as did Chris. Um, but this is something I'd like you to comment on. And in the presence of the Tanishta here, I think, um, I, you know, the suggestion of setting up such a forum or such a, a committee to you know, pursue this uh, is a very good one and I think should be followed up. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry, Excellent we're out of time discussion. for questions. So really, I'll answer part of that really quickly. We have a national AI strategy. It's two or three years old. We have an AI ambassador and there's ongoing policy work on AI, including through, through the European Union. So this is very much a live policy discussion. But obviously the technology is moving very quickly and there are larger questions. Um, so we've questions from three different questions. 
one very specific one in Northern Ireland which might be interesting for people to, to hear an answer to. Anybody? I can speak to this, please, uh, if that's okay. Um, just on that, just to clarify, uh, in 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 all in the spirit of fairness. So, um, when I spoke about um, uh, the policy underpinnings uh, being at a kind of a, a level of low maturity, uh, not just in Ireland, this is really across the globe, and it's something we have to work on globally. So it's, that's just clarification. But on that, I would say, um, Richard, to your comment about the national AI strategy, there's really, quite frankly, very little depth on security and defence matters. So I think the argumentation I was trying to bring to the, t to the table is we need a dedicated security and defence analysis on AI-related matters. So, so I think that, I think, uh, and all science and technology questions and future technology matters. So thank you. Hey, hey, Chris? Uh, just two, two brief comments. One, one would be that I don't think being in NATO or out of NATO has any effect <coughs> at all on the degree of cyber risk that this country faces. And even if it did, you should behave as if it didn't. Um, it would be terrible if you were wrong. <laughs> the, the second point I would make is, and thank you for raising the school issue, I think that's really important. Um, and I, I think it's a difficult question. I, I, in the UK, we are moving to that model, but it, it really depends on your teachers and your educators, because there's a danger that we scare kids beyond what's reasonable and have a, a negative consequence. So making people self-confident in the use of digital information is, is really what's important. And cybersecurity should just be part of that engagement with the digital world as it will be in 10 years' time. The other point I would make is if you want to spend any money anywhere, spend it on your teachers and the STEM teachers. Because especially in the North, I don't know so much in the South, but I've heard comments in the South that the quality of teaching in in the early years in science and engineering is what will make this country strong in the future. And I, and I don't think Northern Ireland has at all got this right. Uh, and if it's a, you know, it is probably the most important area of, of, of society at the moment to equip our next generation to build the data centers and resist the machine learning and understand what, that, what the algorithmic harms are of these things. But I don't think we're doing our young people very much service in this area right now. We need dedicated professional teachers who are well paid in this topic, especially in STEM. Sorry. Chris, thank you. We've got the general right and then and Rob. Bob. Yeah. Um. Sorry. <laughs> are you sure you don't have a debate? No, no. I'm just not aimed at you. It's, it's aimed, to be honest, I'm hoping people in the north are listening because our, our, our government has lost a lot of money recently and, and part of the cuts have been focused on this particular topic, which I feel passionately about. And as a, as a, a university educator, I can't fix 10 years of of missed opportunity to learn. Well done, well done. General? Yeah, just, just to, uh, on the Senator's point on, on education, and again, bearing in mind the, um, the participation by uh, Irish public servants in, um, in civilian missions and uh, Irish military personnel in military missions, the facilities of the European Security and Defence College um, are there, um, you know, and have been there since 2018 and have conducted courses uh, and seminars and like to date have trained over two and a half thousand um, civil and military public sector employees so you know for the future um, the information that I have is that there's you know going to be deeper co deeper cooperation with operational agencies and national authorities to develop in-house capabilities and increase visibility you know to bring that level of education certainly for our, and we see it as a huge benefit for uh, military personnel and I'm sure the same for civilian personnel but I, I know that it's, it's, it's widely used and it's, it's very beneficial and those courses are only increasing. Yeah. Thanks, General. Bob? I was just, I'm actually going to go on the, the education point as well. I fully echo what, what um, Chris was saying as well, that um, essentially if you think about it, our entire like youth generation are digital all the time, at all times, and we do train them in physical things like safe cross code and crossing the road and that kind of thing, but we don't do it in the digital space and we let them out into a cesspool of the internet without any kind of like guide rails on how to actually get there. But we could change that around and turn that into one of the unique strengths of our country, that if we educated these people to the level that they can see a scam coming a mile away and actually enjoy it, which we do culturally as a country. We mentioned the, uh, the e-flow earlier and you're like, yes, got one over and I didn't get me to click on it, right? We love getting one over scammers and things like that. So like, take that culture and actually adopt it with the education factor to the fact that every Irish person is proud to be able to be the frontline defense for cyber attacks. 
<laughs> that, that would invariably happen too. Okay. But th thank you, Bob. And that, that, that attitudinal piece is how the NCSC responds to incidents yep, as well. 100%. Um, with violence. <laughs> the, so really quickly, on the education piece, just to close out and before I close up in general, part of the, the work we've been doing in the junior cycle short course that Senator Crock will refer to is exactly that. We tried to build cybersecurity skills from junior cycle, which is 12 to whatever it is, 15. Um, and I have since, through a whole variety of different courses, through skill nets and through the universities, have a full set of educational opportunities in cybersecurity at every level of the skill chain, and no matter what age you are. So you can come into cybersecurity very late in your career through a skill nets course, a HDIP, a diploma, whatever it might be, because we're trying to get as many people from the full spectrum and stack into STEM industries, even if they're late in their career, like someone like me. So everybody, thank you very much to our panelists. The next, the next session is back in here at five past four, so we'll see you all then. Thank you.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Could we have you all seating again, please, so that we can start on time? We're good to go. Um, so thank you for those of who are still here with us uh, um, this evening. So we're in the graveyard shift, so we'll do our best um, uh, to get through this topic. It is, as most of you know in the room, um, uh, a, a subject area that's at the forefront um, of our minds here in Ireland, but also um, across Europe. Um, so, so what we're focusing on primarily is maritime security and critical infrastructure. We have four experts uh, with us today, as you can see. We have Brendan Flynn of the School of Political Science and Sociology at the University of Galway. We have um, Laura Bra Brian, Brian. Brian uh, incoming CEO of the Maritime Area Regulatory uh, Authority, uh, otherwise known as MARA. Um, our third uh, speaker is uh, Robert McCabe. Uh, Robert is an Associate Professor and Director of the Maritime Security Programme at the Institute for Peace and Security at Coventry University. And our fourth um, uh, uh, eminent expert is uh, Christian uh, Buger. Uh, Christian is Professor of International Relations at the University of Copenhagen and a director of the Safe Seas Network on Maritime Security. So the idea, as, as you'll see in the agenda and the um, programme abstract, is that we will focus on maritime security in Ireland's territorial waters and the wider exclusive economic zone. So when you hear us talk about the EEZ, um, that's what we're referencing. Um, we hope to consider the risks facing Ireland's critical infrastructure and the implications of this both for Ireland but also our international partners. The Thornishta uh, earlier this morning mentioned the extensive size of the EEZ. Uh, the country is also home to fibre optic cables that carry close to 97% of global communications, as well as energy infrastructure for the entire island. Ireland also has ambitious offshore renewable energy plans. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn to our panellists um, and uh, take it from there. So I'm going to begin uh, in terms of uh, framing the conversation. We're going to speak first to the, the nature of the threat landscape and the role of the state. So in this regard, um, Christian, um, uh, um, I'm going to turn, turn to you first. In light of the current, the specific threat landscape that we see at the moment, uh, what is generally a state's role um, uh, or the state's role in protecting critical infrastructure? Thank you so much and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Let me start perhaps uh, this way. Ireland is an island. So what happens out at sea is absolutely vital and fundamental for, uh, for Ireland. And because of this, the topic that we're discussing here today is uh, absolutely vital. Ireland is fully dependent on the sea. And we're living in a new era. Since last year in September, we fully know that gray zone attacks by state adversaries happen at sea, and they do happen in exclusive economic zones. So this is what we know. The other thing that we know is that our dependency on the sea is radically increasing because of the green transition. Wind energy will be the future energy. We will require hydrogen from the sea. We will require the sea for carbon storage as well. So we really need to start thinking and putting these two things together, gray zone attacks happen, our dependency on the sea will increase substantially over the next 20 to 30 years. What are the consequences from that? One of the consequences is we need to upscale our game on how we are protecting these infrastructures so that broadly, on the threat landscape. Thank you, Christian. Uh, Brendan, from your perspective, um, how do you view um, uh, the threat landscape with kind of an Irish, uh, an Irish perspective? Yeah, um, looking at it from an Irish perspective, because Christian sort of set the scene, I, I think it's actually, it's turned a corner in the last, um, actually in the last few weeks, it's actually changed dramatically because the chair, uh, Dmitry Medyev, 
the chair of the Russian National Security Council um, just two weeks ago indicated that he thought it was quite acceptable that Russia could attack, and he specifically said this, uh, subsea infrastructure or cables. He didn't mention Ireland, um, but he mentioned Western countries. And that to me, if we were holding this meeting a year ago or two years ago, particularly two years ago, the Ukraine war has fundamentally changed the threat profile because we have a serious global power, a state actor like the Russian Federation, which if it is crazy enough to do the invasion of Ukraine, you have to make a calculation that it's crazy enough to do other things in the maritime space. So there's a concept in international relations called horizontal escalation, which is that there's a conflict here and it's not going well for me, so I'll shake things up over here. And I would be very afraid as the Ukrainians struggle in their counteroffensive. Where we're going in the summer, I don't know, um, but it is possible that the Russian Federation could seek to exploit a horizontal escalation. And it is further possible that that com could come into our waters. So that's a realistic possibility. I did not say probability, I said it's a possibility. And the fact that it is a mere possibility is a fundamental order of magnitude in the nature of the threat. Thank you, Brendan. Um, Robert, would you, would you like to give some of your thoughts um, uh, on, on, on where we find ourselves today? Thanks very much, Katrina. And so I think we have a, a long history in the state of actually really not taking the maritime domain very seriously. So we, we often call this uh, in circles a sea blindness. And this is despite the fact that Ireland is an island nation with a, a maritime territory, some eight to 10 times its landmass. So what we do have is a very capable and highly trained naval service, but actually that lack the capacity to operate across the full spectrum of the maritime space. So by that I mean in the air, on the surface, and below the surface. And as we move further offshore with our infrastructure, um, as, and a lot of the infrastructure is also under the sea, uh, we, we need to really think seriously about how do we build this capacity moving forward. And there's, there's a few different options there. So uh, apart from just procurement of large vessels, we, we, must, we have to look at technology as well. And of course, technology can, can't replace well-trained human beings, but it can act as a, a force multiplier in making the capacity of the naval service uh, that bit more effective. The other thing I just flag at this point as well is the importance of the private sector and all this. So the vast majority of, of this type of infrastructure is privately owned. And at the moment, a lot of the cooperation between the services of the state and the private sector is primarily carried out on an ad hoc basis. So there needs to be some sort of uh, contact point, perhaps a single agency, where these different voices involved, as we move further offshore and it becomes more critically important, uh, can meet and exchange information. Thanks so much, Robert. I think that's a great um, segue, uh, actually, to my question for, for Laura. And um, with respect to what role um, do the public and the private sectors play uh, in this space when we're talking about the protection of offshore uh, critical infrastructure. And I think while you're doing that, Laura, if, if you don't mind, I think it would be helpful for, for us all as a group, um, because you're, you, you're the incoming CEO of Mara, just to hear a little bit more about like, the nature of Mara, like what its purpose is, if you don't mind. So thank you. Yes, no, thank you, Katrina. So, um, MARA is a new regulatory agency that's been established on foot of the recent Marine Area Planning Act. And its primary role, very simply, is sort of to facilitate competing demands for space on the seabed. And, it's, and we will be doing, carrying out that role on foot of sort of supporting much broader government policy, whether that's around increased use of renewables, supporting access to sort of data infrastructure um, across the island. So what Mara will be doing will be working in the area of sort of consenting mainly private infrastructure to have access to particular areas of the seabed that will allow them to put infrastructure in the ground. So this will cover areas such as wind turbines. So recently announced sort of four new projects, mainly on the Irish Sea, um, Similar projects in the future will go through a MARA consenting process. Also things like uh, transmission infrastructure, so electricity transmission infrastructure. You know, a good example would be, say, for example, the Celtic, infra Celtic interconnector that's going to be running from Cork to um, northern France. And when it comes to this, th these are sort of long-lived 
infrastructure assets. They're going to be around and delivering value for 20 or 30 years. There's a lot of money involved with these investors. So if you take, for example, the Celtic in interconnector, you know, the total value of that is about 1.5 billion euros. The Irish end is, is financing some of it. The French end is financing some of it. There's been grant money also provided from the EU. But we have to think about is, is, is what you know, we all need to be looking at is a stable um, investment environment. So obviously, MARA will be doing its bit in terms of a stable regulatory environment for the consenting process. But you know, when, when a private investor is thinking about investing in these things, it cares about and managing a range of risks, whether that's financial risk, technology risk, regulatory risk. But they'll also now in the future be thinking about security risk. And obviously, that's not within MARA's remit. But you know, where we are sort of within the kind of broader um, ecosystem, we want to be able to say, you know, as part of that sort of piece, that yes, we are able to facilitate that investment and manage those risks. Thanks so much, Laura. Thank you. Um, what I might do, and we'll come back to you, I think, Laura, if you don't mind, in, in a minute. Um, uh, Brendan, I want to turn to you with respect to kind of based on the on the description you gave um, uh, uh, about the kind of the, the current. Uh, threat landscape that is most concerning to you. Um, I guess the question then becomes, um, and I know we'll hopefully get to this in the Q&A, uh, what, what do we do? So what do we do in terms of either national resources um, or partnerships potentially? Um, so I'd love to hear from you uh, in, in that regard. Yeah, um, the, we had a bit of a discussion about it beforehand and I said I'd sort of focus a little bit on ports and uh, oil and gas and I think, I think uh, my other two colleagues are going to focus on the cables, which gets a lot of attention, the internet cables. But what, what I notice about the maritime gas infrastructure, just to be specific about the gas infrastructure, because it is mainly maritime, most of our energy and fuel either comes in through the sea or it's actually harvested at sea. So it's marine dependent, right? Um, we actually have excellent emergency planning infrastructure in place in the terms of there is a plan, there is a responsibility. What I think Ireland, and Ireland's not unique in this, uh, maybe a deficient in after the current situation with the with the threat that's emerging out of the the spillover of the Ukraine conflict is the ability to project a presence at sea which deters and the the key the key phrase there is the ability to have a presence at sea and what that translates into is not boots on the ground but but boots on deck and that translates into a navy or coast guard and I know I'm conscious there's a lot of people from the navy here uh, and they're probably tired of hearing this, we, our Navy is simply far too small. They actually have the ships. Um, they, the pro there's a problem with recruitment. Now, that's not just unique to the Irish Navy. So I would identify building up our naval uh, service to actually match the ships we have. Um, but you mentioned the word partnerships, and I would identify uh, partnerships as crucial here. So these are EU partnerships, or they're uh, EU and NATO partnerships. There's a very important joint task force which brings the EU and NATO together on uh, issues of critical maritime resilience. And that is an absolutely critical working group. The, the jargon doesn't sound very attractive. The joint task force word sounds military. It's actually a bunch of senior civil servants and emergency planners who are sitting together in Brussels, collaborating and working with industry and with coast guards and navies and with energy uh, stakeholders. And that's absolutely essential. And Ireland's in that, and that's a great thing. Um, but we might want to consider other partnerships, and I can maybe talk about that later or, or at another juncture, but partnership is absolutely crucial. So whatever our neutrality position is going to be, and um, the Tónisca laid that out and lots of speakers laid that out, I would just stress we need to be flexible so that we can participate in partnerships that involve our EU um, friends and neighbours, and many of them are also NATO. Uh, members, so we need to be able to collaborate with uh, EU and NATO, which other NATO, oh, sorry, other neutral countries like Austria and Malta um, have extensive collaboration with NATO, extensive collaboration with NATO, and it's unproblematic, and it doesn't seem to cause some kind of concern that their neutrality is disappearing or anything like that. So, partnership and our navy would be the two things I would focus on. 
Thanks so much, uh, uh, Brendan. Uh, I think, um, Christian, I think it would make sense to really um, move across to, to, to you to hear uh, what are some of the good practices that you've been seeing or um, some of the measures uh, being taken vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the use of resources in an effective manner uh, or um, the types of partnerships that you think are effective. Absolutely. <coughs> Absolutely. In, in, in addition to what Brendan was uh, just saying, we also need eyes in the sky. Right. Yeah. Uh, so that is basically drones and uh, satellites. And, and it's wonderful to see how bad we are in finding out what happened in, in the Nord Stream attack. It tells us how limited maritime surveillance actually is. And here we're talking about the Baltic Sea, and everyone thought the Baltic is the most surveilled maritime space in, on, on the planet. But still, we are struggling to find out what actually happened. So upscaling maritime surveillance, and that quite obviously requires close collaboration with the infrastructure industry, using their sensors, using their surveillance measures that they are already in place. It does not necessarily require military assets. It requires a military deterrent in the background, because after all, when we're talking about state adversaries, we are looking towards Russia. So it will not go without a heavy military deterrent. However, that is being, uh, being organized. We need to also have a conversation about uh, who is going to pay for this. And that, for me, mainly means to have agreements with the industry in terms of what kind of best practices and what kind of security measures they are actually going to implement. So it doesn't fall all on the taxpayer, nor should it all fall on the consumer uh, of energy, of the internet, and so on. But some of it should also fall on the shareholders. But obviously, this is not something that the industry likes to hear. But critical maritime infrastructure protection might also mean less profits. At the same time, we have to be cautious about not putting the maritime industry at disadvantage over the terrestrial industries. When we're talking about wind farms, we all know that wind farms are 1.5 times more efficient than those on land. And no one likes to live close to a, a wind farm on land. That's another benefit of having them uh, offshore. The same time when we're talking now about critical maritime infrastructure protection, we should make sure that we do not put these industries at a disadvantage. Last point, it only works if we're doing this together. It doesn't make much sense if you have half of an electricity cable that connects you with France. It only makes sense if you're collaborating closely with the countries that you're connected with. If you're looking at data cables, it's the UK, quite obviously, the United States and Canada. If we're looking towards energy, it is France, it is Spain, it will be Portugal in the, uh, in the future. Uh, and so on. So close collaboration with these countries, and that can be in smaller settings, that can be within a European Union setting, or within all of the other agreements that we actually already have in place. Some of these are actually environmental agreements. But let's not forget an attack on a major inf uh, infrastructure at sea often will also mean maritime pollution. So there's no reason why we can't use the mar maritime arrangements that we have, uh, for instance, in the North Sea, the bond agreement for that purpose, for making Coast Guards working together, for having information sharing agreements across countries that are connected by infrastructures. Sure, of course, Just a, Robert, a yeah. very brief Absolutely. point on that, just uh, kind of zooming it back to the, the, the national level. I think at the moment we do have multiple agencies, uh, both state and non-state involved in the, this, this sphere, so there's a lack of a common platform where all these different voices can kind of come together and discuss issues such as subsea cable protection. So I think that's closer to home, maybe that's, that's a starting point, is to create some sort of single agency or an information fusion center or basically a focal point where the concerns of industry and government and other actors involved uh, can come together. Because again, given the lack of attention to this arena historically, these platforms don't really exist. And, uh, and that's maybe one starting point there to to get a better understanding of the full picture. Um, 
Thanks, Robert. And actually, Laura, I'm going to jump to you in a second. But Robert, are there any examples of that type of mechanism or uh, agency in other jurisdictions? Yeah, I mean, in other maritime security contexts, you have what you call information fusion centers, for example, where um, pertinent information is received, it's analyzed at the center, and then it's given out to the various actors that it's, it's relevant to. So that, that's one potential example. Um, another example, or another potential uh, possibility would be to um, expand the remit of uh, existing state agencies that are within the Department of Defense um, that's focused specifically on maritime security and, uh, and involve all the actors there. So th these arrangements exist in other, in, in other places in different, in different contexts, basically. Great, thank you. <clears throat> um, I think, Laura, um, it, it would be really um, helpful for us, given, given the plans um, for new offshore renewable uh, energy infrastructure, um, have you any sense of how we should go about then the protection of this new infrastructure in future? Um, could you speak to that? Yes, certainly. So, I mean, I think there's probably sort of, again, you know, the, there's two bits. There's, when we come talk about offshore renewables, um, you know, obviously there's the wind turbines. So they're very visible. They, they will be sort of, you know, visible above the sea level. And then at the same time, matching that, there's going to have to be transmission cables undersea that will take the electricity that's generated from the turbines and bring it to land. Um, you know, the initial sort of target for Ireland is um, 5,000 megawatts of offshore renewables by 2030. And that's going to be matched by a corresponding level primarily of transmission cables that are kind of coming into Ireland. But when we move beyond that, and we're talking about the post-2030 environment, and sort of the, the sort of significant potential there is even to go up to 30 um, gigawatts of, of renewables, a lot of that is going to be exported. So that energy is going to be exported. So then you're talking about cables that are going, you know, maybe from wind farms off the West Coast, so they're going around the north of Ireland, and um, maybe to Scotland, to the UK, or, you know, down to sort of France and the Bay of Biscay. So, I, and I think sort of maybe we're going back to sort of the, the, the piece that, that the sort of Robert talked about there, which was, there's no point in us only doing our bit, because if something happens to some of those cables, we impact the people that we're going to be exporting to. They're going to be upset if something happens on, on the Irish end. At the same time, if you look at the Celtic interconnector, we would expect to be exporting to France, but we're also importing from France, depending on, on sort of which resources are available. So our security of supply you know, within the country is again dependent on the French doing their piece on, on their end, because we can be just as impacted by something happening there. So I, I, I think it's, it's, again, to pick up on what Robert said, it's not something that we, a, as an isolated country, can do in its entirety. We do have to be involved with cooperating with the countries to which we are going to become interconnected. And again, you know, my message is always sort of, the future is going to be quite different from the past. In the past, we really haven't exploited our maritime environment. You know, we now recognize that that's a high value um, resource that we have, and you know we want to use it to, you know, achieve energy independence, meet our climate action goals, you know, protect sort of biodiversity. But that means that we are more and more going to be inter interacting with our nearest neighbours. You know, we're only interconnected today to the UK. There's two transmission lines: one that goes sort of from, you know, north of Dublin over to Wales, and one that goes from Northern Ireland to to Scotland. That's all we have with physical infrastructure on the electricity side today. We have a gas pipeline that goes from Scotland to Ireland, and we also have, you know, sort of gas coming in from Carib, you know, on a pipeline in in Tomeo. The future, we'll have an awful lot more, and I think it's it. You know, we can't do it ourselves. It's going to need to be, at a minimum, on a bilateral basis. But also, we are sort of working within the European context as well. Certainly, when it comes to energy security. So, I think from from a European perspective, you know, the sort of Europe-wide energy security is going to require that that level of cooperation. 
Thanks so much, Laura. And I think, um, again, a perfect segue vis-a-vis -vis, um, your mention of Europe. Uh, I think, Christian, what I'd love, I know um, Brendan did speak to some of the matters relating to uh, the EU um, uh, and NATO, but Christian, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to maybe dig in a bit deeper and hear from you about the kind of the current um, either ambitions or plans or, or measures that might be coming down the line to, to deal with this space more effectively. Well, to start with, we have quite a setup of fancy European Union institutions and agencies which are, do not come cheap, right? So we should use them well, including for critical maritime infrastructure protection. And quite obviously, uh, that includes the European Maritime Safety Agency uh, based in uh, Lisbon. And they actually do run a, a European-wide information sharing network where they're currently looking into how this also can be used to protect critical maritime infrastructures. But we have many more agencies, perhaps too many, which includes also the European Fishery Control Agency. Uh, it includes Frontex, the Coast Guard Agency, uh, after, after all. It in includes ENISA, uh, the Cybersecurity Agency, and, and so on. So I think part of... Uh, the future lies in organizing Europe more efficiently. And I think the common information sharing environment, which is supposed to integrate all the European data sources, is a super important step into that direction. There's something else super fancy on the horizon, which is the European maritime security strategy. The commission has delivered a draft uh, that came out in March, and the European Council, under the Swedish presidency, is right now negotiating the final version of it. This is going to be a super important vehicle for coordinating activities across Europe. There's a very extensive action plan part of that as well. There's more or less three focus areas in uh, the strategy. The first one is strategic competition, so there's a lot of stuff on the Atlantic and in the Pacific. The second one is critical maritime infrastructure protection. So this is indeed a priority uh, theme in terms of surveillance, exercises, uh, and so on. And the third one is going to be in the climate change and bio biodiversity space. And this is literally something that we should not forget about when we're talking about maritime uh, security. Um, as I said before, we are dependent on the ocean and uh, matters such as sea level rise and uh, extreme weather events will affect all of us and will also constitute a future risk for the maritime infrastructures, including the ports uh, and so on. So a lot of stuff is happening uh, in Europe and it's more about making good use uh, of it, uh, in particular in the light of the forthcoming maritime security strategy. Great, um, thank you. Actually, just on that, Christian, um, where does the Critical Entities Resilience Directive fit in? If you wouldn't mind explaining uh, to us all, like, what is it in the first instance? Where does it fit into this landscape uh, that you're describing with respect to the, the upcoming strategy? Um, but also then, maybe if, if one of our panellists want to speak to what that might look like, um, in the national landscape in terms of that, the transposition of the directive into national law. Mm. Is that something you, you mm. might speak to? So basically, uh, critical infrastructure protection has been on the European agenda for quite some time. Initially, it was mainly with a focus on counter-terrorism. Mm. So it's part of the response to 9-11. Uh, to and gradually, it has shifted uh, then towards cybersecurity uh, issues. Now, quite obviously, when the European Commission was working on uh, the new directive, they were already, uh, it was already uh, last year, and uh, Nord Stream uh, already had an impact on it. The directive mainly attempts to actually get an overview of what countries think are national uh, critical infrastructures. Uh, and in that sense, uh, will be important for understanding what, uh, what goes on, what is critical, what is actually happening, and so on. I'm a little bit skeptical of the uh, directive. And the reason for that is it does not properly understand how the maritime space works. 
because if we, as we have established earlier, in the maritime space, we are talking about interconnections. We are talking about difficult legal spaces, the exclusive economic zone, the international waters, uh, and all of these connections. And a purely national approach that is then coordinated by the commission in, in Brussels, in my eyes, doesn't capture what is actually required. However, it's a good step in, in, in the right direction. Great, thank you. So I think that leaves us with um, uh, in and around 40 minutes, 35 minutes for um, hopefully a, uh, an interactive discussion. What I'll do is I'll open to the floor, I'll take one or two questions and then I'll take some from uh, Slido. So, so I see, um, yeah, I see two hands here. And please feel free, if you don't mind, to introduce yourself if you like uh, for the speakers. So, yes, of course, yeah, thank you. Um, just to, when you were setting the scene, and, uh, Brandon Flynn. He quoted Medvedev. He quoted uh, the former president, actually, yeah. Medvedev, in relation to the comments he made. But from my memory of the, I remember the comment. He made that comment in the context of the Nord Stream 2 situation, um, which is very relevant when we're looking at a risk assessment. Because when we look at the infrastructure, and I fully agree that we must look after the security with partner nations, etc., in relation to it, but it should not be used as a reason for dragging uh, Ireland into, you know, giving up our neutrality. So I think when we speak like that, we should give all of the facts. And um, Christian, the colleague on the right, also referred to Nord Stream 2. And you mentioned aircraft. It amazes me that all of the intelligence that's available, etc., that nobody has been able to say, despite, I think, uh, Denmark, Sweden had investigations, etc. Uh, there was some suggestion that it was Ukrainians that carried this out. But there, most of the actual commentary on, uh, you know, in the media, there has been no, you know, the, the, the ability to carry this out, everybody doesn't do it. You don't embark on a yacht with a couple of sticks of jelly knife, you know, and do this, you know? And so I think myself, you know, I've heard other reasons as to who <coughs> carried this out. I certainly know that for a long time in Ukraine, certain countries had an obsession with Nord Stream 2. And uh, the president of America referred to Nord Stream 2 and the ability to do away with it. So I think when we're talking on a very serious issue going forward on the neutrality, I don't think that we should selectively quote facts that suit a particular agenda. We should put all of the evidence on the table mm -hmm. and then sit back and look and see where it leads us. I agree fully with all of the speakers there in relation to the importance of looking after the infrastructure that is there at present and in relation to the infrastructure that will be there at some future time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, what we'll do is we'll take the other question and then open to the, to the panel, if that's okay. So, yes, please. Hi there. Um, I'm Scott Fitzsimmons from the University of Limerick. Uh, given um, the, the forward-thinking comments that have been made by the panel regarding uh, the infrastructure that Ireland not only has now, but hopes to develop over the next decade or two, um, what critical priorities should we focus on, whether through PESCO or other, um, other uh, project development initiatives, to help us defend that infrastructure that we, again, have now or plan to have in the future? Thanks so much. Um, Brendan, do you want to speak to the PESCO question? Yeah, I can yeah. come back to this then, one, but I, yeah. the PESCO one is, is germane. There is actually, um, PESCO's on its fifth I iteration of projects. So PESCO is a, is a little bit like some people were talking earlier. It's a sort of a club where countries pool together as they want to. So not every European country is in every PESCO project. And it's down to kind of coalitions of the willing who are interested and able. And countries get to pick and choose what suits them. So it's perfect for Ireland that doesn't want to get involved in certain things and does want to get involved in other things. There is a new PESCO project which is led by the Italians. Uh, and it has Sweden involved and has France involved and Germany involved. Uh, and it's uh, called uh, CMIP, which is, or sorry, MCIP, which is Maritime Critical Infrastructure Protection. And that will be 
developing a suite of technologies, but also practices. Sometimes people forget that PESCO is not actually developing necessarily technology or kit. It's actually developing capabilities in terms of understanding and learning and doctrine and tactics and techniques. Just, just to briefly go back, because my, my other colleagues may want to come in, um, uh, if, you, if you don't like the Mediv quote, which of course is interesting because it comes a whole year after the Nord Stream attack, um, so it's interesting why would he come up with uh, a justification based on the Nord Stream attack right now. Um, I think it's not coincidental that it's linked to what's going on on the ground in Ukraine, that they're losing the war. Um, uh, if you don't like that, there's a pattern of activity which is, is threatening and menacing. There's a pattern of, of activity that is threatening and menacing. And most fair-minded and reasonable uh, people would, would, have, would have seen that. The Norwegians, two weeks before the Nord Stream attack, had a, an event where many of their oil platforms were buzzed repeatedly, repeatedly by drones. And when they investigated this, they quickly discovered that this couldn't really be what happened in Dublin Airport, where you had some amateur person, I think, who was involved in some kind of hobbyist thing or they were messing around with drones, more a nuisance thing rather than a subversive thing. This was something a little bit more serious. Um, so that's one example. Then we have the example of our own coast of um, Russian uh, auxiliary ships uh, engaged in activity that is not readily explainable. And, and so there's a whole pattern of activities which you'd put together. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't select the Nord Stream event as, as why I would have um, a fear about the Russian Federation. It's the small matter of the fact that they've initiated the largest land, land invasion of another country since 1945. And it's the small matter that they're openly threatening the use of tactical nuclear weapons on a repeated basis. Those two small things make me concerned that we're dealing with a hostile, dangerous, unpredictable actor that could take some of that unpredictability into our waters. That is not an unreasonable set of assumptions to go off. It doesn't mean you exaggerate in terms of your response, but it, it changes our risk profile as a country. Excellent. Um, what I'll do is, um, there's some really good questions on the Slido, so um, thank you for that, Brendan, and, and for addressing um, both questions. Um, I think what I'll first do, and, and, and Robert, I'll, I'll address this question to you if you don't mind um, uh, first. Um, here, uh, uh, James uh, asks, Ireland lacks a national security agency, strategy and council. How would the speakers suggest we best reform our structures to counter grey zone, hybrid or cyber threats from Russia or other hostile states um, uh, and actors in the maritime domain? So I'll let you think about that. And then what I'll do is um, maybe Christian and, and Laura, if you feel uh, you're comfortable with this um, uh, question. Uh, I have a question from Kieran Murphy uh, about the EU um, um, strategic um, uh, landscape. And he asks, given uh, the EU maritime security strategy, so EU MSS, yeah, uh, I'm not sure if you can see it up above, uh, is there not a role for the EU in developing or supporting, um, sorry, it suddenly disappeared off my screen. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so, given the EU maritime security strategy, is there not a role for the EU in developing or supporting a comprehensive security strategy mm -hmm. for Atlantic-based infrastructure, mm -hmm. including the pooling of EU member state maritime surveillance capacity mm -hmm. and primary radar potentially using PESCO projects? Mm -hmm. So, two uh, very good questions. Um, Robert, if it's okay, we'll, we'll kick off with you. And please feel free to, to jump in on, on any of the questions, Brendan and Laura. Thanks very much, Katrina. I think it's a really important question uh, about this idea of where we sit nationally on security. And I think a, a strategy really is the kind of foundation to, to build um, on from, say, this discussion and, and other conversations uh, on security. I think if I can put it back to, I think, the importance of the maritime domain, and maybe I'm, I'm a little biased, um, necessitates that actually we, we need to look at the maritime the domain as a separate domain of security as opposed to just uh, as part of the national security debate. So what I, I, I would suggest in that context it's actually worth thinking about a national maritime security strategy specifically, mm -hmm. which is something many states uh, have enacted. So I, I can see two kind of potential options there. So firstly, Ireland develops uh, an independent national maritime security strategy that aligns closely with the, the forthcoming EU maritime security strategy. And I think that's critical there. There, there needs to be close uh, alignment between the two um, and, and the, the, 
the next question will probably uh, talk to that. However, it has to recognise Ireland's unique uh, national governance structures, agencies, challenges, and available capacities. The second option then is Ireland forgoes a national uh, strategy um, and instead closely aligns with the, the forthcoming EU maritime security strategy instead. And other maritime states in Europe have, uh, so this is not a unique position either. For example, I think um, Portugal and Denmark don't have national maritime security strategies. So the main issue with the second option of not having a national maritime security strategy is the potential lack of buy-in nationally for country already struggling with, as I mentioned before, issues around sea blindness, maritime security capacity. So it kind of lets the conversation drift a bit more. Um, the advantage of developing a new strategy is the opportunity to engage multiple stakeholders. So members of the public, uh, the military, the private sector, state, non-state, uh, in essentially uh, uh, this feed into the process, feed into the conversation uh, from the start with the potential then leading to a more kind of inclusive, impactful and sustainable strategy moving forward. And, and from my perspective, vitally increasing national awareness uh, of the importance of a secure maritime domain for a state like Ireland. Thanks so much. Uh, Christian? Yes, on the Atlantic. <clears throat> so in Copenhagen, I'm uh, chairing a, a research group on ocean infrastructures. And actually, just last week, we have finished a study for the European Commission that wanted us to look at uh, what are the vulnerabilities uh, of critical maritime infrastructures. And one of the insights uh, that came out from that study is we have to th think about critical infrastructure protection in regional terms. Mm -hmm. The infrastructures, but also the threats and vulnerabilities, they look completely different in the North Sea than in the Mediterranean, mm -hmm. than they do in the Atlantic, than they do in the, in the Arctic. <laughs> And we really need to feature that in. So it does not necessarily make sense to have like one global European uh, approach. You can have a European umbrella, but then you need to start tackling what do you need to do in the North Sea, in the Baltic Sea, in the Black Sea, and so on. Luckily, in the European Maritime Security Strategy, I haven't seen the final draft. It's not published yet. Hopefully, they're not working on it anymore. Um, at least in the, uh, in the first draft, there was the clear commitment actually to see the European Maritime Security Strategy as an umbrella document and then continue pursuing to develop regional sea basin strategies. And I think having one for the Atlantic is actually absolutely vital. And the actor within Europe that has been mainly uh, advocating for that is Portugal. So. In many ways, actually, Portugal is a natural European ally for Ireland, small states, Atlantic state. So this, I think, is clearly the direction in which we need to uh, walk. And I think uh, Irish leadership in these regards would, uh, would highly be welcomed uh, in Brussels. Thank you. Thanks, Christian. So we're going to open to the floor. I think we have three questions at the back. Um, Good afternoon, uh, Chair and panellists. Uh, Jonathan Hoare, the Sea Fisheries Protection Authority. Uh, and I think it would be remiss in the context of this discussion uh, not to mention uh, our sea fisheries stock uh, and our mandate as an authority uh, in terms of enforcing uh, sea fisheries law uh, in our 200 mile EEZ. Uh, and that's important uh, from a security uh, perspective uh, for two uh, ways which I'll mention. Uh, the first of which is in terms of how we actually undertake that work, undertake that work and that's done uh, through our service level agreement uh, with the Defence Forces and our Navy who carry out uh, at sea patrols uh, on our behalf. And it's already been touched upon in terms of resources there and so on and so forth and I don't in turn intend to dwell on that point. But what we're talking about here are emerging threats and competing demands and how that impacts on fulfilling uh, our mandate in terms of protecting sea fishery stocks and protecting that 200 mile zone. The second way we undertake that work uh, is through our cooperation with the European Fisheries Control Agency, and I think Christian has already mentioned that entity. And in the broader context of the discussion that we've had today, I think EFCA is a very useful case study in terms of European-wide cooperation and this type of work. 
Uh, IFCA undertake uh, patrols uh, in community waters uh, in our 200 mile EEZ uh, and we uh, participate in joint deployments and cooperate with those patrols and as recently as the past 48 hours we had a very successful detention uh, which was brought uh, into Castledown Bayer just 24 hours ago. So that's a very, very useful case study in terms of how European-wide cooperation uh, can provide solutions uh, from a security perspective and from an enforcement perspective. Um, thank the panel for their time. I think it was just important to, to put it on the record of the forum and, and, and to, to bring, appraise the forum of the importance of our remit in that regard and the asset that is or fishery stocks and how they need to be protected also. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me, uh, my name is Thomas Gould, and the Sinn Féin TD for Cork North Central. But I also sit on the Housing Heritage and Planning uh, Committee in the Doyle. I suppose one of the first points I wanted to make, I think it was the first speaker who raised it, was in relation to the North Stream. We're talking about protecting the Irish waters. We couldn't protect the North Stream, which is surrounded by European countries, which probably has one of the most highest surveillance uh, seas in the world. And we still don't have an answer who done it. And we're here trying to talk about protecting the Irish Sea. And just figures released to me uh, yesterday from a PQ um, that there were, sorry, I'm just looking for it. There were 39 days since the start of the year where Irish vessels couldn't go out because they had staffing issues. We have one vessel out trying to patrol the waters. We're talking about security here. And I know Laura's in, and Mara know. Like, we have no, like, I don't know, do people understand? Our, our naval service is so, mal, so badly staffed at the moment that we have no capacity to do uh, most of the stuff that's being spoke about here. So I think the number one objective should be for major investment in the Defence Forces and in particular the Naval Service. The previous speaker there talked about patrolling our waters and ensuring our fish stocks and, like, we don't know what's been taken over waters, what's coming in. We had a crazy scenario last year where we had West Cork fishermen and Kerry fishermen having to go to face down the Russian Navy. I swear to God, like, it's unbelievable stuff. And we're talking about our security here and developing strategies. We can't get a boat out. We can't get a ship out in our waters. So I think the priority here should be major investment in our defence forces, particularly the Navy. And also, I don't even think this forum should be on today. I think we should be holding a citizens' assembly on Irish neutrality. <laughs> and, all these, and all these questions should come up. Citizens' assemblies have done a fabulous job of getting, letting the Irish people's voice go out there. And then we should have a referendum on our neutrality. I'm listening here and I've come into this section, and the war neutrality, the Irish people want it, I think the Irish people want to hold on to it, and they don't want it to be diluted by uh, threats that are talked about, external threats. If we look after our own defence forces, I think that's where we need to start first. And these conversations then can be had by the Citizens' mm. Assembly and during the referendum. They're a Thanks so much. I think before we move to this third question, if you don't mind, and we thank you for your patience, because I know you've been waiting a while. We'll get back to you and we'll get back uh, to uh, Professor Cotty as well. I, I have two interesting um, questions that I would also uh, like to put to the panel afterwards. But uh, I think first we'll get to these two, if that's OK. So please, Robert, please feel free. Yeah, and Christian. Th thanks very much. Uh, I think what we've heard is testament to actually what, what our naval service is doing under extremely trying circumstance at the moment. The, the breadth of the work they do, I think back to 2014, just since we're in Cork to mention it, this uh, 80, 80 million euro worth of cocaine was intercepted by the Naval Service at that time. And so the work they do for the issues they have is commendable. And I think that's something to be recognized. I, I fully agree with the, um, the, the, the last comment as well. That actually, and I think this, there, there is broad consensus across the board that neutrality isn't at odds with investing in our defense forces. And I think that, is, that should be a priority, and particularly, again, maybe unbiased, maritime security capacity is fundamental here for an island nation like Ireland, moving more infrastructure offshore and moving forward. And I think that's one thing that there is consensus about, that the, the two things aren't necessarily at odds. Having a well-funded, well, a well -funded, capable defence force 
and being neutral. Uh, there shouldn't be a tension there. In fact, it should be the, quite the opposite. The two are, are mutually kind of feed into each other, I think. So just wanted to make that point. Mm. Great. Christian. Exactly. Just to follow up from this one, I think part of the point is also not to become an easy target. And uh, what we have learned from uh, the Russian government over the last uh, couple of years that they are out for, uh, out for easy targets. But very briefly on the fishery, uh, because I think this is much more vital actually than many people think. Mm -hmm. Because not only are fisheries uh, an important industry and so on, but if you actually would want to attack a critical maritime infrastructure, if you want to cut a cable or attack a wind farm, uh, and so on, or make a pipeline explode. The, the ideal way of to, how to do this in a hidden way is to do, use a fishing vessel. Right. So we need to have a very good understanding of the fishing vessels that operate in our waters, and we need to have a very good understanding which ones of these are legitimate and, uh, and which ones not. So fishery is absolutely crucial in the picture and again, it's important to have information sharing uh, towards uh, the other maritime security agencies and do that then also on a European level to put the picture together of what is suspicious activities and what could be a threat. And I, I would just add, I, I agree very much with what the deputy said, that we should invest in our Navy. And I was very clear on that, I thought, that uh, I'm somebody who would be arguing that, that we, we need to have more people there and whatever that takes. It's not straightforward how you get to that, you know. There's many people in the room here who know it isn't straightforward how to get the manning levels and get the personnel levels and get the pay and conditions package right. That's, that's a complex piece of work, right? And don't pretend it isn't. So w there's wide agreement. And I think the value of a forum like this is that we can actually discover points of agreement that are very interesting. But I would add, and we possibly wouldn't agree on this, um, is that uh, neutrality is completely consistent with being an active and ambitious and a pragmatic, pragmatic partner with EU states in EU projects, in PESCO projects, in collaborations, and also NATO, with NATO and EU collaborations. And I come back to the example I gave at the start, landlocked Austria would happily trade their geography for ours. Landlocked Austria collaborate extensively with NATO. Um, Switzerland, which is the epitome, and we're going to hear about them later in the week, um, they have a partnership arrangement with, with NATO, which is quite extensive. Um, Moldova, which is neutral, has a partnership relationship. Cyprus has a partnership. Serbia has a partnership relationship with NATO. Everyone has a partnership with NATO, practically. They have 31 members and 38 partnership arrangements. So if you want to be a dynamic and credible neutral, I think it also means you have to be not isolationist. You need to invest in your navy. You need to guard your own waters and your own fish. But you also need to be a player. You need to be able to collaborate where the new technologies, the new techniques and procedures are being developed. For instance, all of this new drone technology, it's changing every 18 months. So I was speaking to a German naval officer about this, and he, he's working for, an, a, a, actually it's not a NATO um, center of excellence, and his punchline was to me, I would love to have some of your Irish naval people to come and collaborate because your people are outstanding. Why aren't they here? And I, I said, I don't know. Thank you, Brendan. So I'll just um, uh, speak to two questions coming up through Slido, and then we have one, two, and uh, three, three questions uh, in the room. Um, one, one question is speaking to, um, ask, actually asking for more information on the options for cooperation with the UK specifically, um, bilaterally, or through NATO. And the second is um, speaking to uh, matters pertaining to um, China. Um, and I guess on that front, the EU is engaging in the Indo-Pac, uh, Indo-Pacific region uh, on maritime um, uh, security matters. So what does that mean for, for a state like Ireland? So um, I guess with respect to the bilat piece, I, I wonder maybe Robert or Brendan, you might want to jump in on that, and uh, Christian on, on Indo-Pac. But Laura, please feel free to jump in on any of these uh, as you want. So. I can just very briefly say that I think cooperation between Ireland and the UK in the context of this infrastructure is, is crucially important because both states are directly connected. Uh, I, I think the, the UK did invest in new assets specifically related to the protection of undersea infrastructure. Um, again, in the wake of Nord Stream, I think, or at least that was the, the kind of um, catalyst uh, there's there's a possibility of sharing of assets in that sense. I, I, we we know already, the, you know, 
the, the UK in terms of kind of air defense is actively involved unofficially in kind of um, patrolling or, or in, intercepting assets in Irish, uh, that have gone into Irish airspace um, that we currently can't do. So there's that kind of ad hoc unofficial cooperation. But I think with the, the maritime security stuff, there's a much more, there's a lot of scope there. Um, I don't necessarily know exactly how that could go, but um, they certainly have more assets than we do, and potentially there's some sort of collaboration that can happen there, whether it be training or exercises. Um. Yeah, I, I, I don't know, Laura, do you want to come in? There? No, I was just going to sort of pick up on something that one of the people in a previous panel said, that from an energy infrastructure point of view, we're already interconnected mm -hmm. with Northern Ireland. And if we have a security supply problem here, they have a security of supply problem. So whether that's sort of a land originating security of supply problem or because we've lost an interconnector either to the UK or new into France or, you know, sort of the new offshore renewables are not able to deliver for whatever reason, it affects Northern Ireland as much as it does us. And those cooperation arrangements already exist today. So it's, it's not a stretch to say why, you know, why are they not, would they not be used for more maritime stuff in the future. Yeah, I would just name check two things. The NPSA, the National Protective Security Agency of the UK, it used to be called the Critical Infrastructure Centre. They had different acronyms. They've changed that. They're a key agent that we should be collaborating with very closely because they're setting out training standards and norms for critical infrastructure, whether it's ports, gas pl plants. I also think it, it, in kind of the space that, that you're in, um, I'm really, I have a PhD student doing a project in hydrogen. And I think we've some really amazing projects that could emerge. Like we have proposals that with the ESB and Carbon X that off the coast of Kinsale, the old Kinsale gas field will become a hydrogen storage hub. Britain has actually gone to the stage of putting out specifications for what that looks like in terms of planning standards and safety, which is a huge piece of work. Mm -hmm. And so we will have to sit down closely in a Brexit space and collaborate with our British friends on safety, on security. The maritime, as Christian said, the maritime space forces you to share, collaborate and partner. And I think from Mara's point of view, we are a new agency, we are starting up. We are going to be very focused on learning from what's happened in other European countries, whether it's our near neighbour, the UK, or whether it's sort of some of the other maritime countries, particularly Denmark obviously is more advanced than us when it comes to consenting and planning for offshore renewables. You know, one of my key roles would be, be out there sort of learning from our European partners and finding out what have the Dutch done, what have the Belgians done, what have the Danes done, the Portuguese, because, you know, for better or worse, we are a little behind some of the other countries, but the advantage to that is we can learn from what they've done, what worked and what didn't work. And, and, and I think that's sort of something that Ireland has been good at across a range of areas, and we'll continue to do that. Thanks, Laura. Christian, would you like to speak to yeah. the Indopac aspect? Or, just or? to chip on uh, to this one, Belgium. Uh, I think the Belgian model is uh, one of the most fascinating, uh, into, mm. both in terms of planning as well as protection. Very quickly on the uh, Indo-Pacific, that's quite obviously a topic in its own right. Uh, but here the logic basically goes, if you want to be uh, uh, taken serious as an international security actor, then you have to play in the Indo-Pacific. It's the big theater, and if you want to be taken seriously, then uh, you have to show some posture and uh, do something there. Is the European Union very successful in this? Most certainly not. The strategy looks uh, absolutely... Sorry, are you suggesting that we do go ahead with the NATO office in Tokyo? I'll no, 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 no. I'm, I'm not I'll kind of like uh, talking... I'm talking about the European Union. Yeah. Um, so... No, no. If you, d if you wouldn't mind, we'll just let the speaker finish his remarks. Thank you. So basically, uh, I, d I don't see uh, a, a strong maritime security role in naval terms for the European Union. Instead, I think what will be important is to focus on what Europe is good at. Right? And Europe is good at collaboration, fighting crimes at sea. Let's not forget that used to be the heart of maritime security, and I think it still should be. Fighting people smuggling, fighting illegal fishing, fighting piracy, and so on. And Europe has quite a good record, actually, in helping other countries through capacity building. And that, uh, in my eyes, should remain the nucleus of engagement with uh, 
Southeast Asia, with the Western Indian Ocean uh, countries, and also the Pacific Islands. So I think this should be the heart of the, <clears throat> of the European strategy. Thank you, Christian. So you've been extremely patient. Thank you very much. So we'll start here, and then Professor Koshi and... Hi, uh, Brendan Gordon. I'm a medical physicist down at CUH. Um, I was just wondering, um, it seems to be pretty much the panel consensus that we do need to greatly expand our capabilities in terms of Navy and maritime surveillance. Um, but given the issues of retention of staffing and retention of expertise, not just in the Navy and the Armed Forces, but across the health service, policing and all that, would you agree that not just in relation to the maritime issues, but to international security as a whole, that we need to take a holistic approach and address the social issues of housing that are contributing so much to why people don't find careers in these fields sustainable and often have to look abroad. Thank you. Uh, Professor Cotty. Thank you, and fantastic panel, by the way. Thank you very much. Um, one issue that you didn't get into the detail of is um, the seabed internet cables, which has received an awful lot of attention. Um, you know, how big is that threat? Is it the case that you know one, one well-placed bomb and Europe's internet goes down for weeks, or is the threat exaggerated? So if anyone could say anything about the seabed internet cables and the sort of nature scale of that issue, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, and, and then if you like, uh, would you, if you have a comment or a question, then these are the last questions, so we can get to that, if you like. Yeah, oh, yes, because you'd asked, if you like, yeah. And then we'll um, let the panel um, speak to each of the questions and conclude, if that's okay. So, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Lisa Lee. Um, I'm a Master's Student of International Public Policy and Diplomacy here at UCC. Um, thanks to this panel and all the panels, it's just been, you know, um, just so informative on so many different levels. Um, my question uh, really is about the issue of the securitization and criminalization of refugee flows predominantly in the Mediterranean. And I think it would be remiss uh, of us not to actually look at the human issues at the heart of security threats. Um, I, uh, there has been a criminalization not only of the refugees themselves, but in recent times, very worryingly, the criminalization of aid workers actually helping um, migrants who are drowning at sea. Obviously, you know, there was another tragedy just a couple of days ago off, off, off the coast of Greece. Um, I suppose I would like Ireland and urge Ireland with its key strength in humanitarianism and, you know, strong um, and commendable history on peacekeeping as a member of the European Union to actually stand up for the migrants and the disparity in the welcome of Ukrainian refugees um, by the EU, which is really commendable. But then that sits in stark contrast to the treatment of what are deemed irregular migrants, um, like those coming across the Mediterranean. Um, just on a final one or two points, Frontex, um, you know, the maritime surveillance um, grouping of the EU, you know, I don't have the statistics to hand, but the funding of them, their new premises, their, their, their whole operation, why can't some of that funding um, be taken away from the securitization of the refugee issue and actually placed in addressing some of the very complex issues that cause these refugee uh, flows? Um, and lastly, just in terms of if this issue of securitization of the refugees themselves um, in the maritime waters, it's actually lending to an insecurity um, and causes deep, deep other problems which actually threaten our security. Um, and I'd urge EU countries to not adopt this isolationist approach um, in, in you know, difficulties with burden sharing, etc., and actually have an EU-wide approach, but also one centred on the human lives being lost and not just our own individual uh, security issues. Thank you. Thanks for your thoughtful remarks. And then just uh, one more, and then uh, we'll, we'll move through the panel. Could I hold so. mine for a moment, and they might answer Professor Crotty's question first. Sorry? Could they answer Professor Crotty's uh, No, I think we'll do it this way, if you don't mind, because we're, we're, we're completing the panel. Right. Yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Thank you. Thank you, Declan. Um, there's been sort of an undercurrent in the media in the last couple of weeks to the effect that, God forbid, if they go in with scissors and cut the cables, 
the internet will be down if they blow up this or if that happens. And that there's this whole spin that it's so easily done. And um, inadvertently, it's creating the idea that, yeah, we, need, we have no protection out there. Actually, in truth, the private companies have done a phenomenal job in protecting those cables, particularly for the internet, since they put them down. The recovery time is phenomenal. The monitoring of it is phenomenal. They're dealing with fishery accidents, floods, all sorts of issues. They can cope phenomenally with that. The point made by Thomas Gould and other speakers, if we invest in our own capabilities, marine, aviation, to police that part of the ocean that's relevant to us, and like our man in the fishery sections was talking about earlier on, use cooperation with other European agencies to keep an eye out for obvious um, chinks in our armour, like we do with Interpol. We don't necessarily, as Brendan Flynn would seem to be indicating, and I don't want to be putting words in his mouth, God forbid, but that we wrap up NATO, NATO, NATO. It doesn't have to be like that. And just one final observation, if it gets to the stage where it's so bad, don't think that people are going to be running around looking for cables to cut. They're going to be looking to where the cables are coming on land, be it gas lines, electricity cables, but I don't think it'll ever come to that. I'm an optimist, as long as we have an open mind and we talk and listen to the people <coughs> that, uh, that we may not want to talk to. Great. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thanks for that. Um, so we're, we're, uh, we'll, yeah, we'll let each of you, uh, the order I'll take um, uh, is uh, Laura, Robert, Christian and, and Brendan. So Laura, I'll let you speak to any of the questions or concluding remarks, whatever, whichever you prefer. Thank you. So obviously I'm sort of slightly different in the sense that, as I said at the beginning, you know, Mara doesn't have a security role. Um, but we are definitely concerned or impacted by if there was a perception that there was, you know, sort of a lack of security available within the maritime space. I mean, I think it's sort of been a very interesting and broad ranging discussion today. And I think, you know, some of the key pieces that have pulled out, particularly with regard to sort of sea fisheries and, you know, in terms of sort of energy infrastructure within the maritime space, this is a new area within the maritime space. Previously to that, we have probably been concerned about security when it came to sort of fishing, when it came to, you know, crime, uh, and, and that's sort of where the naval resources have predominantly been deployed. As we um, sort of look at building more infrastructure, you know, more broadly and in a larger surface area in, in sort of the maritime environment, we will need to have to sort of have a think and see how, how does that impact on what we do already? Do we need to sort of change practices or build capacity? Um, so I think that would be really kind of where, where I would conclude. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Thanks. Yeah, I think these questions have been really, really interesting. And there's a whole breadth of issues here, which kind of, to, to some extent, indicate the complexity of a lot of the issues we're, we're talking about today, including the maritime space. Uh, one of the issues I come up with this idea of uh, comprehensive understanding of, of the, the issues at play, I think with maritime security, traditionally the way a lot, a lot of academics look at it is in this kind of comprehensive manner. So it's not just about one single security threat. Everything is interlinked from the bottom up to the and kind of top down. We talk about environmental issues, economic issues, uh, issues of sustainability, and at the top down there's obviously state on state issues. But actually, as, as Christian mentioned, maritime security traditionally is about these kind of uh, issues such as crime, um, and uh, the question there about uh, the issue of um, migration. And the, so the only thing I want to say about that is, uh, I, don't have any, I don't have answers, of course, is that, again, the Irish Naval Service has been uh, active there. They, they had a boat in the Mediterranean that was responsible for rescuing hundreds of, of migrants in, in that space. So again, for an underfunded, overstretched service, they've really been pushed above their weight in that regard. So, and it, sh it shows again that with more assets, they could do more good things, essentially. So uh, I think that that's the only point I wanted to make, that the comprehensive approach is important, that you have to look at it from not one single kind of, uh, one single space. And, and, and again, the term maritime security means different things to different people, depending on who you ask and, and the context. So it, there's, a, there's a lot to unpack there, I think. Thank you, Robert. So Christian and Brendan, uh, Christian first, but uh, we have one, one minute before we conclude, yeah. and I'm trying to keep to time, so I get invited back. So um, uh, please do me the honour, Christian, and then uh, Brendan. OK, I have to speak very, very fast. Uh, <laughs> so cutting cables is super easy, right? But we have many of them. Ireland is actually relatively fine. I think we, it was 17 or 27, and they're spread across uh, uh, the island. So uh, Ireland is uh, p pretty safe, right? The key challenge is, uh, first of all, choke points, right? Uh, 
around Egypt, in the uh, British Channel, and so on. And these are quite obviously also important for Ireland. They're important for, important for everyone. Challenge number two are actually exclusive economic zones because it is really, really tricky legally to establish uh, what they can do in an exclusive economic zone and what not. Right? Uh, look at the, 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 Irish, the Russian naval exercise, right? That's legal. You know, everyone can come into your exclusive economic zone, do a military exercise. Uh, there was this documentary about the Russian scouting uh, Infrastructures, yeah, it's all legal. It's all within the frame of the, of the law of the sea. Is it spooky? Is it scary? Does it require some sort of response or at least some presence at sea? I think so. Otherwise, uh, you know, this harassment uh, in, in the end will uh, continue. And no one wants to have a Russian uh, life shooting exercise in the exclusive economic zone, I think. Thank you, Brendan. <clears throat> But I just kind of respond to your question because I think it's a really good one. And uh, what I hear in your voice is compassion. And I totally uh, agree, actually, with you. And if it was uh, down to me, I would want the EU to be at sea and do, engaged in active rescue. But unfortunately, the EU is uh, it's a diverse collection of nations. And uh, you probably know the story of the origin of the current iteration of the mission that Malta, which is a neutral country, uh, strenuously objected that the mission would go ahead under the older model, which was rescue first and then figure out how to deal with these people in desperate situations. And by the way, if I can just say that the culture of all naval and civil mariners by default is to pull people out of the water and rescue them. It's a very strong ethical norm, which is really unique to the maritime space. Um, Italy and Malta have, have basically placed political limits on some of the levels of ambition. Can I just say generally, before I, she puts me in a sin bin forever, <laughs> um, the European response to a mass irregular migration at sea has been much more humanitarian in comparative terms compared with Australia or compared with the United States. So when you actually look at Europe overall, um, it could be an awful lot better. It was quite good for a short period there. Uh, can I just say that the current operation is focused on interdiction of arms smuggling, and that also is a humanitarian. Don't forget that if you're not just rescuing people at sea, but if you're interdicting arms flows into Libya, which is chaos, that's part of the reason why we have an uncontrolled, chaotic situation. So I am hugely sympathetic to where you're coming from, but it's a very complex, as Robert said, it's a very complex set of problems. Thank you, Brendan. So um, before we thank the panel, um, I would like to invite uh, Dame Richardson to uh, wrap up the sessions uh, in due course. But um, uh, we'll, we'll leave, uh, are we, we exit? Yeah, so, um, so please thank me, uh, or please join me in thanking the panel. So. I did want to thank you all for your uh, participation, your patience, and your perseverance in staying right through the day, and a special thanks to those who are, who are listening uh, online. Um, I do think that, that the scale of the risks we've heard described so eloquently today um, really demonstrate just how important it is that we have conversations like this. And I would hope that the... Um, the range of views expressed both across from the floor and from the stage um, disabused those who thought this was going to be a, um, a, a stitch up, I suppose. Um, you know, it, in, in any conflict, it, it's very tempting always to see things in Manichaean terms, in black and white terms. And I think um, with social media, we have all do this so much more, thumbs up, thumbs down, likes, not likes. Uh, but in fact, neutrality, not. Um, but as it was clear from the conversations to me today, there is a wide range of views on what neutrality actually means, and clearly no consensus on that. So I very much hope that this is a question we'll be able to explore further uh, in the days to come. 
I thought there were a number of themes that came out today, none of which were resolved definitively, all of which we'll be coming back to. But this theme of um, this web of connections and mutual dependence on every issue discussed was, was absolutely apparent. Um, the, one, the one point on which I think there really was consensus was a line in the last panel by Laura Bryan, which is that the future will be different from the past. I think we can agree to that. Um, but there were very clear themes about the importance of, of um, thinking about in inequality and inequalities both nationally and internationally and how this has an impact on our security and indeed on the globalization of security generally. I think there was also a real pride in the role Ireland has played internationally in the past. And again, we'll be hearing about more about that in the days to come, especially when we think about our, our mediating role and the role of our really heroic peacekeepers. Um, but I do think there was the sense that the extent to which Ireland can influence and protect itself from the global threats we face, given our location, given our size, is, is, is a real and open question. And it's a question I think we'll be coming back to. And it's a question I'm sure many people here and listening online have, have views on. So if you haven't uh, responded to the, uh, uh, to the consultation process, I hope you will. You can do so online or in writing. It is open um, until July 7th. And details are available on the government website, GovIE uh, Consultation Forum. So uh, to the hardy amongst you, we are repairing tonight to Galway, where we will have four more sessions. Um, and tomorrow we will be looking at Ireland as a global actor, uh, three sessions on various aspects of that, um, and then another on research and innovation. So again, uh, and one final point, I did, uh, did just want to draw attention to the um, really quite wonderful young man. I'm not sure if David is still here, but his, uh, the youth, there he is, uh, the youth, de uh, youth delegate to the UN, but his role in connection with the UN um, did not cause him not to really draw our attentions to some of the deficiencies in the UN and the needs for reform. Uh, so thank you for your contribution, David, and best of luck with the rest of your tenure. So with that, let me thank you all, wish you a good evening, thank you for participating, say goodbye to those online, and hope to see many of you tomorrow in Galway. Thank you. <laughs>